Hi everyone and welcome to In Deep Geek Live. This is the latest in a series of live streams looking at the history of Westeros right the way from the Dawn Age all the way up to uh, the, the story of A Song of Ice and Fire. What? Th this thing? Oh, th I just threw this on. This is uh, this uh, me honouring a promise I made to some of the, the regulars and some of my my favorite people in, in this wonderful community that we've built up. Uh, when I started out doing uh, doing this uh, on YouTube, I had this cowl hood um, that I uh, wore and uh, I promised when I hit 300,000 subscribers, I would wear it again. Uh, so here it is. I think I've only worn it once in, in the last four or five years, maybe. Uh, but here it is in all its glory. This is particularly for you, cloaked one. Uh, as, a, as a thank you from me to you for all of your generosity. Um, so I do have to say this is actually very warm. And uh, nowadays I've got like a light shining on me as well. I have to do for the green screen thing. So I'm probably going to just do that if you will forgive me. Um, uh, but I, uh, I, I've got it on and I hope, uh, I hope you all enjoyed that. So um, before we get into uh, the, the main part of this, then what I wanted to do was just very quickly give you, as I always do, a little bit of, I said it was quite warm, I'm just going to, it can come back on later. Um, the, this week we've had some big news about Game of Thrones, about um, the spin-offs. Uh, if you missed it, we had the trailer for, or the teaser trailer for House of the dragon, the first teaser trailer that we've had, and um, it was really good. I have to say, I, I, I analysed it. If you were here a couple of days ago, I did a live stream, impromptu live stream. I just decided, you know what, I'll just, I, I want to talk about this, so I went live, uh, talked for about an hour, working my way through the trailer. If you're interested, check back on the channel; it's there. Um, but what I wanted to say now is, I really liked it. I thought it was really good. Um, I know that there's a lot of people who've got uh, reservations about spin-offs following season eight, but I have to say it looked good. It's only a trailer. We haven't seen the whole thing yet, but so far, so promising. So I'm quite excited. If you want to watch the trailer itself, you check out over on, I've got a link on my Twitter if you want to go and check that out. Um, uh, did have a super chat before we went live from uh, Mara Lee. Hi there, Mara. I see you're in the chat uh, today saying congratulations, Robert, on 300,000 subscribers. That is fabulous. Thank you. Uh, looking forward to today's live stream and hopefully being able to participate in the chat. Thank you for all the hard work, creativity and love you put into everything you do. You are the best. And also you did a super sticker as well. Uh, thank you very much. I hugely appreciate that. And you did another. Oh, thank, very generous, Mara. Thank you so much. Uh, another super chat. Just say super chat saying for the uh, for the hood. Uh, yeah, I appreciate. I I have in the back of my mind, and this is one of the things that I love about this community. Is there's always cleverer people than me. I have in the back of my mind that there's there's a fancy French word for the hood, uh, which covers the head and the shoulders. Uh, but I can't. I can't for the life of me. There's anyone who can remember what the proper word for that is. Maybe it is just a hood. I don't know. Um, I would hugely appreciate that. There are also a couple of um, uh, things from last week. Uh, what I try to do is always on answer as honestly and as full as I can everything that I, uh, I get asked. Uh, but occasionally I have mind blanks. There's things that I don't know of the top of my head. Uh, when that happens, I try and pick them up again next week. So uh, I had a couple. Uh, one was from, oh, and I didn't actually note down. Oh, this was for EP uh, saying, uh, do you think the Rhoynar got some inspiration from Carthage? Um, and off the top of my head, I couldn't come up with a good answer for that. Um, but I thought about it, had a quick uh, look around. The Carthage, for those who don't know, this is a city on the uh, what is now Northern Africa, I think it's maybe Libya now, I'm not 100% sure, but this was a major city um, back in the sort of pre-Roman era, um, and for quite a long period uh, going into that as well. 
they were a trading uh, city, a trading port, um, and there was uh, lots of Phoenician empire uh, came up through there as well. Um, they controlled a huge amount of the trade throughout the Mediterranean. And I think for me, yes, I can see where that's coming from. I think that the Rhoynar, though, with, if we're thinking back to when we're thinking about the Rhoynar, they were more of a river than an open seas people. Yes, we have Nymeria who set out, uh, who set sail out across the open seas, but generally speaking, they were a river people. And when they came to dawn, again, they found the river. So it's more of a river culture that we're looking for. And I think perhaps for that, you could look at the Sumer culture, Tigris and Euphrates, just as humanity was, was emerging, civilizing and settling down. Um, but also another early culture, the culture around the Ganges. I, in my younger days, I traveled uh, a, a bit around India, and I think it's quite hard for a lot of Western minds to conceptualize the importance of the Ganges. Uh, it's not just a holy river, it it's, it's, has a life uh, as a river, and it brings life to all the people. Uh, and that, um, for me, has more of the feel of what's going on with the Rhoynar, because the river Rhoyn was their god, and the gods came out, and there were more gods who emanated out from that that were expressed through the river and its environs. So that's more of the kind of thing that I, was, uh, I think George R. Martin was going for. Secondly, uh, I had a question about Yin that um, I did answer at the time, but I, I, I think I could probably have given a little bit more context looking back at it. This was when the Nymeria and her fleet headed out. One of the places they stopped off was Sothorius, and they tried to settle down there. And the main part of the, the company settled on the coast, and they had a huge amount of problems. Sothorius is not a good and easy place to live. Uh, but a smaller detachment of them went upriver to uh, this uh, city called Yin, an abandoned city, a cyclopean city is what it was described as, um, which could mean like a cyclops, but probably means with sort of, it's a style of architecture as much as anything with slightly mismatched size uh, building blocks. Um, they go there and... They struggle against, uh, and I just want to get the exact words there, the brindle, they had to contend with the brindled ghouls of that cyclo uh, cyclopean city. Um, and uh, there's no greater explanation of this. It's called a haunted city. And then one day, ship goes up there and everyone's gone. And the question is, what happened? Well, this is a page of text now get any more information than that so to speculate we just have to say it's the same as what seems to have happened to everyone else who goes to that city and to other parts of Sothorios in the jungles in the, the world outside and in that haunted city there were ghouls there were nasties there were there were bad things which just wiped out these foreign invaders these these colonizers uh, and that is what happened. They were just wiped out in one go. Um, so at that at that news, Nymeria said, that's it, we're gone. And I think that that, for me, is the clearest example of that. She thinks they're dead. She would not have just left them. If she thought there was a chance of a rescue mission, she would have done something. She thought they were dead. She'd heard reports of what was going on there. She knew what was happening. And when they all disappeared, that's it, they're gone. Uh, so that's the, uh, uh, the 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 two bits of business uh, left over from uh, last time. Uh, let me just quickly pick up. I think I had a couple of uh, super chats while I was talking. Find them. Uh, maybe I can't find them. Uh, Yes, so I had one. So um, Smith Crazy saying, um, hi, Robert, what kind of things would you have done differently if this was your uh, invasion? This is talking about the Aegon's invasion. I will answer that one in just one moment. Uh, 
Um, Adam Rush didn't see a question attached to that. Thank you very much for the uh, super chat, though. Um, and uh, Cloaked One saying, thank you for answering that super chat question about Carthage from last week. You're very welcome. That was one that you picked up. And this is actually, uh, I will say to you personally, this is one of the reasons I particularly wish to honour my promise. I would have been anyway, but uh, you are so generous in picking up questions from other people in the chat when I, uh, I'm uh, when I'm doing these if it's particularly if it's just me then the chat moves through so quickly I can't keep up with everything there I can see super chats because they're highlighted and when you pick them up for other people that is incredibly generous so thank you very much um, and you wanted to give credit for to Andrew K for the cowl idea uh, and for reflective rambling for super chatting it well there you go uh, I will give I wanted to do uh, sort of a semi-serious note before we get into the full topic today a, a thank you uh, to everyone who this is this has meant a lot to me reaching I hundred thousand is a huge number of people I, I, I genuinely wasn't sure that you know just doing this that, that that it would happen but it has and this wonderful community has grown up and um, I am very happy today and I am incredibly humbled grateful for everyone who has been supportive, who has played their part, who has, um, particularly today as we're doing a live stream, the moderators who do an amazing job. Thank you, moderators. Oh, and if you consider yourself a part of this community, if you just happen to watch a couple of these videos every now and then, thank you. Uh, and uh, uh, a glass of Dornish Red is awaiting me after I uh, finish this. So uh, cheers and thank you. Okay, uh, uh, what well, I think I had uh, one or two others. Um, uh, Lyle Hammock saying, uh, in appreciation for all your outstanding content uh, and to many more streams in the future, thank you again for all you do. Thank you very much. Um, Ariel Winchester saying, congratulations on 300K to the best creator. Well, that's very generous of you. Thank you. Uh, thank you for all your constant hard work and dedication. You're helping me make it through nursing school. Well. It, if I helped you get through nursing school, I will be a very, very happy man. Uh, thank you. Uh, and Cloaked One uh, saying, first off, you wear a cloak better than me. I do not believe that for one second. Uh, thank you for humoring us. Uh, and second, congratulations for 300K subs. Kudos to you for all your commitment, dedication, uh, hard work, and patience in creating this space. Um, you are very, very welcome for that. Okay, uh, so thank you uh, very much to everyone for your uh, best wishes on that. Let's get into um, the subject today. I'm uh, somebody was asking who was it? Uh, it was Smith Crazy. Uh, what would I have done differently if it were my invasion? Um, well, thankfully it wasn't my invasion. I'm not really an, an invading sort of guy, to be honest. But um, I, I think. Uh, what I'll do in a second is just give an overview of the invasion as a whole and then get into certain specifics as we go through there. As always, I'm going to frame this around questions from my patrons and pick up as much as I can from the chat. Um, but the in terms of what I would do different, I will say up front, not much. Uh, they They actually played this very well. The only thing that didn't work be honest was dawn and um that maybe they could have realized earlier on that this wasn't going to work with dawn and come to an accommodation uh, a lot earlier that would have saved a lot of lives and a lot of heartache and i think that is probably the only thing that i would say they got wrong yes there were some small mistakes along the way, but broadly speaking, if you were to map out what they could do from a very, very small start to take over the entire continent, it was it was a pretty astonishing uh, display from beginning to end. So uh, not much would be the change. I think I would just come to an accommodation with Dawn a little bit earlier. Uh, Jack Myatt, thank you very much for the Super Chat, saying, hey, Roberts, uh, something to say. Thanks. Uh, what parallels uh, will or do Danny's and Fagon's invasions have to Aegon's? Uh, and who knows about Fagon's true identity and who will reveal it? 
Um, well, the, the main echoes are with Danny, it has to be said, because uh, Danny has got the three dragons. Aegon and his sisters had three dragons. Her dragon, main dragon herself that she rides is Drogon. Drogon, everything is an echo of Beleriand, the Black Dread, the colouring, uh, the, the language usage. George R. R. Martin is echoing the one with, with the other. So, uh, and, and they are going to be invading, of course, from the east. And I think they're going to come into, certainly they did on the show, and, and I think it makes sense as well that they will land at Dragonstone and then try and take the Seven Kingdoms from Dragonstone, whereas Fagon obviously has landed down in the Stormlands. So the main echoes are there with Danny. Um, Fagon is try trying deliberately to echo all of the Targaryen reign with kind of symbols of of Targaryen-ishness, Targaryen uh, if that makes sense. So we will see with the creation of his Kingsguard, we will see that he will, I suspect, get the sword Blackfire, which was Aegon the Conqueror's sword. Um, I have a feeling that he'll get a, get crowned with uh, a symbolic crown, maybe Aegon's crown uh, or one of the others. The Targaryens had lots of different crowns. Um, uh, and then... Uh, he will do uh, sit on the Iron Throne and try and adopt Targaryenish uh, sort of behaviors. So he is trying deliberately to copy what the Targaryen, or he will be trying deliberately, I think, to copy the Targaryen model. Whereas Danny, it's just there's an echo, <laughs> and it's just there that people see. She's not trying; it's just it's just there. Um, as for who will, um, who knows about uh, his his true identity, his Blackfire identity? I think you mean uh, by that. Let me just double check. Uh, who knows about Fagon's true identity? If you're talking about yes, his his identity as a Blackfire, which I personally think he is, then it's Illyrio and it's uh, Varys. I don't think either of them are going to give it up. Uh, that information. Who is going to show that he is a fake? Well, it's possible that there will never be a full official reveal of this. If those people decide they do not wish to share that information, then that information will not be shared. It's very possible that Fagon himself does not even know that he's not a full Targaryen. The person, however, who is being set up to reveal this is Danny, uh, because in the House of the Undying, she has these, um, I forget the exact wording of the phrase, but it's the um, uh, re revealer of lies or something along those lines. And there's a number of these things that she's going to be, the implication being she's going to show to be lies, one of which is the, the false dragon, the mama's dragon, which is Fagon. So the implication is that she will do that. How will she do that? Probably with her dragons. It, it, he is going to be a few generations descended away from uh, the Targaryen line. So much like um, uh, Quentin Martell, who also had some Targaryen blood to him, uh, but was quite a few generations removed from it. He will be not immediately friends with dragons. Let's put it that way. So I think that's probably the the, the best or most likely way. Um, question from... Um, Roman Lakovets saying, uh, thank you very much, saying, uh, Song of Ice and Fire can be tough for less perceptive readers like me. So thank you. You're, well, you're, you're welcome. I'm sure you're not less perceptive. Uh, thank you for keeping your videos clear and easy to understand. Also, watching you remove your glasses in HD is one of the greatest pleasures known to man. Keep it up. Um, <laughs> so... Uh, I, I, I honestly, I don't know where I'm, I'm in slightly reflective mood today. I, I'm sure you can probably uh, gather. I, I don't know. I, I love the fact that people count how many times I take off my glasses in a live stream. Um, 
I, I have no idea where that's come from. It's a complete mystery to me. Uh, but um, I'm I'm glad you enjoy uh, watching me put my glasses on and off again. Um, reflective rambling. Thank you, reflective rambling. You're picking up again as you often do questions from other people. Uh, this time from Mathia Dominique. Um, these streams mean so much. Never thought I'd be a part of this type of community. Uh, you're one of the kindest and most ed educative YouTubers. Uh, thank you. Well, you're you're very welcome. Um, uh, and you're also starting to make me a little bit embarrassed with all of this play. So thank you. Um, that's very kind. Let me, um, as I said I would, I, I give an overview of the Targaryen invasion. And then we'll get into a few questions uh, about the specifics of it. So this happens a hundred years or so after the uh, doom of Valyria. The Targaryen family have had a dream. Danis, the dreamer, um, had a, a dream, a vision about the doom of Valyria and moved the entire family over to Dragonstone. They were well away from the doom when it happened. As a result, the Targaryens are the only Valyrian dragon riders left. There are other Valyrian families. House Valerion's the obvious example, but there are a couple of others. Um, and But for a hundred years, they broadly stayed there. They came across with five dragons. Four of them died. Two more are born. Uh, and by the time of Aegon's invasion, uh, there are the three siblings and three dragons and they set off the the um the invasion starts very small it's not a massive army it's it's them plus their local allies being house Valarion, house caltigar a few people up uh, at sort of off crackdraw point um they land in what are sort of disputed lands what is now king's landing at the time it was just hills and slightly disputed lands uh, between two kingdoms, the kingdoms of the, the rivers and the isles, uh, and the, uh, the the storm king, Argilac. Argilac the arrogant as he became known in the stormlands. They land, they win a few initial battles against the small local lords there, and then they split off in three different ways. Uh, Rhaenys heads south, with uh, Oris Baratheon, uh, she uh, wins a battle there. Oris Baratheon wins the battle there with Storm's End. They've gained that area. Uh, Visenya heads north um, and west to uh, the Vale with the Valarion navy. They win a load of battles around the outside of there. They basically win the Sea War. And then Aegon on Valerion heads inland. He goes to Harrenhal. We know what happens at Harrenhal. Um, basically, the river lords turn to support him. Uh, Harren the Black, resolute, says, I'm sitting in the biggest and best castle ever. You're not going to catch me. And then Valerian the Black Dread melts the castle, killing off uh, a house whore. Uh, and after that, they come back and the rest of of Westeros just kind of falls. They go down to um, the other second big battle that they have, the, the Battle of the Field of Fire, where uh, the Lannisters and House Gardner, who at the time they were the Lords of the Reach, uh, the Kings of the Reach, uh, they face them. All three dragons are there and they burn them. Uh, and the Lannisters as a house survive, the Gardeners as a house do not, the Lannisters bend the knee. And uh, when uh, Aegon heads on up to Highgarden, that's where the Tyrells are. They're the stewards, and they also bend the knee. They, they win the southwestern part of Westeros. The north then are heading down south, uh, no, hearing about this threat, but then they see what happens to had happened to Harrenhal and King Torren, little bit of negotiation but then decides he is the uh, the king who knelt he also bends the knee and is allowed to stay uh, lord paramount of the north 
Visenya heads up to the Eyrie. She does some fantastic little bit of diplomacy, just landing her dragon down uh, the top of the Eyrie, which they had thought, um, why not, House Aaron thought this was impenetrable. Nobody can possibly attack the Eyrie on top of this mountain. A dragon just lands down there. Uh, takes She takes um, Ronald Aaron, who is the, uh, the child heir, effectively, flies him round a few times and lands him down. It's a show of power. It's also a show of um, uh, we don't have to do this by war if you don't want to. And basically House Aaron also submits. So at this point, you have got most of what is known, what is now known as the Seven Kingdoms, all bending the knee. Two are still not a part of the Seven Kingdoms. The Iron Islands, the Iron Islands did fall in a, a, a little bit later, I think in year 2 AC, the second year after uh, the conquest, that uh, they they then also bend the knee. With Dawn, however, it's a very different story. Uh, we get uh, Rhaenys going down there first of all, and she uh, meets with um, Melia, uh, Martel, who is an, the aged ruler, princess ruler of, of Dawn, who says, we're not going to bend the knee, uh, but you'll never defeat us. And sure enough, we get this ongoing battle between the Targaryens and Dawn, where the Targaryens come in, they burn a whole load of stuff, the Dornish just disappear underground, they know the area better than anyone else, Targaryens and their new allies in the Seven Kingdoms come in, try to occupy. The moment the dragons go away, up pop the Dornish and kill all of the invaders, and the whole thing starts again. It gets incredibly bloody and horrific. At one point, Rhaenys herself, uh, her dragon gets shot down over the Hell Holt, um, the, and she is presumed dead. The other two Targaryens, mad with rage, they go and burn everything around, but still, you know, the, the Dornish just disappear away into caves or underground or wherever it is that they go. Uh, and then when the dragons disappear, back up they pop. It's only when Princess Melia dies that Nymor, her son, takes over. A peace accord is reached. So, that's the history of the conquest. The conquest is never fully complete, as in Dawn was never actually fully conquered, uh, but the, the Seven Kingdoms, as it was known as the Seven Kingdoms, it was always known as Seven Kingdoms, regardless of how many kingdoms were actually a part of it. Um, that was uh, completed when Aegon was crowned king. Year zero, the calendar was uh, reset. Year zero, probably a couple of years after they'd first arrived in Westeros, he gets himself crowned in Old Town. Old Town at the time, King's Landing's just a ring fort then. Um, King uh, Old Town at the time, the big city, the only real big city, the ancient capital greatest place, most populous place in the entire continent, place where the faith of most of the Seven Kingdoms, the faith of the Seven, is based at the Starry Sept. Aegon get him, gets himself uh, crowned there. That's the point at which the initial invasion is ended, the, uh, the calendar is reset, and everything goes forward from there. So that's your uh, broad overview. Um, Let's have a quick check. I think I had a couple of quick questions in the chat. Um, had one from uh, Michael James. Just uh, give me a thumbs up. Thank you very much. Uh, Jake Sterling saying, do you read anything into the genetic dominance of the first men, stark and strong, when it comes to breeding with Valyrians? Um, so... I mean, I'm not, I don't know the, when you say, do I read anything into it? One thing I do very strongly believe is that the, um, the line, the Valyrian line or the Targaryen line towards the second half of the Targaryen rule 
was manipulated by Blood Raven. I've done a video on that if you're interested in that. And the, in that, I think that it's very clear that he wanted to have the first men blood as part of this uh, through House Blackwood and then ultimately also House Stark. How strong uh, could have been uh, the, the ruling line? Potentially, we'll talk about this more in the uh, the Dance of the Dragon stream in a couple of weeks' time. Uh, but uh, allegedly, but almost certainly, uh, the sons of uh, Rhaenyra uh, were strong. The first children of Rhaenyra uh, were not the sons of um, the Lenor uh, Velaryon, as was assumed her husband but actually uh, of Harwin Strong, member of the Kingsguard. Um, they looked very much like him, at least. So there are possibilities of entering the, the Targaryen bloodline early on, uh, but it, it's only later on, I think, when the bloodline gets manipulated. And when I say the bloodline gets manipulated, what I mean is that Bloodraven kills people that he doesn't want to be inheriting, to put it bluntly. Um, uh, and that does happen later. Cloaked One, uh, this is a question for uh, Fred. Uh, uh, thank you, Cloaked One. Uh, saying, why did the Targaryens, after the Doom, decide to conquer Westeros and not go for the richest regions and cities in Essos? Um, well, this is a good question, and I think I've got... Um, I will sort of tie this in um, uh with Mara Lee, you asked what event or events happened that encouraged Aegon and his sister wives to want to uh, conquer Westeros in the first place. So the, the situation uh, is that the Targaryens, they've gone through, I think, four generations. So Aegon is the fourth generation after the Doom. Um, and during that time, we're not told huge amounts about what the Targaryens they don't play a huge role in the politics of, of Essos, but we're told that they looked to the east. It's only with Aegon who looked to the west. I personally think this is just a cultural thing. This is just, it's now got to the point where initially the family moved off. They were thinking of themselves as being Valyrian. They were thinking of themselves as being Essozi. That makes sense. And then obviously also their children also would have come from the same, uh, they, they also came from Valeria. So they would still be looking back to their homeland. That makes absolute sense. And similarly, the next generation would have been raised the same way. By the time we get to Aegon's generation, he will actually be thinking, maybe not consciously, but why are we looking back to Essos? That's not my home and the home for the family for the last hundred years has been here. It's been on Dragonstone. So whereas he may uh, embrace his heritage back in Essos, he will be thinking, where is Dragonstone uh, best um, uh, situated towards? It's actually better situated towards looking towards the West rather than to the East. Now, the other thing, and I think I've probably got some other questions on this, so I'll try and wrap it up with those as well. But the reason why I think the Targaryens did not, um, to start with, head west, they were always thinking about east, was because that was the Valyrian feel. That was the Valyrian culture. They drew a line. The Valyrians did not want to go to Westeros. There was a, a legend, a prophecy that uh, the the doom, not the doom of Valyria, they didn't have a, a specific uh, as an idea as that, but there was some ill that would come from Lannister gold, Westeros. So it was always viewed with a little bit of suspicion Westeros, the, the Targaryen, the Valyrians did not go over to Westeros. It's only a few generations later that the doom is now well in the past. They can start thinking towards the future. 
Um, Duke the Nuke uh, saying, uh, hey, Robert, hope all is well. In this story, Dragonstone was an outpost for the Valyrians. Uh, did they never come into conflict with the kings of Westeros before Aegon's conquest? So um, this sort of builds on what I was talking about a moment ago. So the short answer is the, the Valyrians, they used Dragonstone as their westernmost outpost. And the idea was that that, along with the other uh, few islands in the gullet, you'll see Claw Island, Driftmark, were held by the Valyrians. This was in order to control the trade through the northern part of the Narrow Sea, and also the trade that goes into Westeros in through the Gullet, in which was the easiest way for trade from places like Bravos and Pentos to get into Westeros. So uh, there, there wasn't a conflict or a need for conflict so much. Um, as a trading relationship and a sort of a, it's a wariness, I think, on both sides. The Valyrians, as we said, had a wariness about Westeros, and I think the Westerosis naturally will have had a bit of wariness about dragons. They had never really come into contact with dragons, but dragons do range widely, and so if you lived around that part of eastern Westeros, then you probably will have at some point seen a dragon in the skies and they would be pretty impressive. So a wariness on both sides. We don't get any uh, reports of particular conflict. No. Uh, Catherine Fursith saying, first of all, congratulations on reaching 300k. Thank you very much. I was wondering about Aegon's actions before the invasion of Westeros. During the Century of Blood in Essos, the struggle for power and dominance after the Doom of Valyria, Aegon, then living on Dragonstone because the Targaryens had left Valyria 100 years before, aided the alliance of Pentos and Tyrosh in defeating Volantis. What does this tell us about how Aegon viewed the old powers of Essos? Um, why did he take, this, take sides? And what does this tell us about his motives for invading Westeros, which was an act of actively and lastingly turning? Essos. Okay, so I think this is a really interesting question. So what we do know, and we don't know huge amounts about uh, Aegon before the invasion, what we do know is that during the Century of Blood, and as you said, the Century of Blood is basically after the Doom of Valyria and the fall of the Empire, suddenly there's this huge power vacuum. Everyone was trying to take control. Everyone was trying to um, uh, assert their place in the new world order, so to speak. Uh, the huge winners were the Dothraki in across the northern and central Essos, what we call the, the free cities, uh, with the exception of Bravos, had all been run with varying degrees of um, direct control by Valyria. They are suddenly all free and independent. Uh, but Volantis, which is the biggest of them, decided that it was the, it was the heir of Valyria. It was going to take on the Valyrian Empire. It was going to um, reconquer at least Western, Western uh, Essos. And they were initially quite successful. Aegon did get involved, and uh, Pentos and Tyrosh ganged up and decided, you know what, we can't have Valantis, who are, yes, big and powerful, just sweeping across the continent and re restarting the Valyrian freehold. And Aegon seems to have agreed. He then, he met them in Pentos, and then he flew Valerion off to, just off of Lys, where... There was a Volantine fleet about to attack that. He burned that. Uh, and then once the, the, and Volantis lost another couple of battles, and once they was put back in their place and politics changed in Volantis, uh, then Aegon went back. So the question is, why? What, what does that tell us about him? Why was he involving himself in Essosi politics? Did he care about Essos? I think the clue comes in 
uh, the world of ice and fire, the last line we get of that uh, about Aegon's involvement says, believing Volantis's rule at an end, he flew back to Dragonstone. Dragonstone. So he was there until Volantis's rule was at an end. He did not want there to be a new Valyrian empire. He was very happy with there being lots of individual small city-states all uh, fighting against themselves, asserting their own control. He was not wanting to be there to be a massive power over on Essos. Then he turned his attention over to Westeros, and you think if he was already planning ahead, if he thought I'm going to be ruling Westeros, what would he rather the situation in Essos be? Would he rather that there was one massive empire which was hugely powerful facing him across the narrow sea, or a, a whole series of independent city states who probably wanted to trade with him? Clearly, in my mind, he, as a pragmatist, would much prefer the latter. He wanted to have smaller city-states who he could trade with rather than one big uh, empire that probably was thinking of invading him at some point as well. Um, I think I had another question. Yes, yeah, so uh, Vilma... Um, not can, can ta? I'm mispronouncing your surname, so I'm, I'm just going to sort of move on and hope that you uh, you accept my poor and weak attempt. Aegon must have had some soldiers and servants with Valyrian heritage during his conquest. Any chance that the people he brought with him might have carried the dragon rider genes? Well, it's possible. So he, we're told that when they moved over to Dragonstone from Valyria, they brought with them all of their family, all of their servants, uh, all of um, the slaves as well. We don't really know what happened with their slaves. They seem to have given up on the practice of slavery later on. But um, they all came across. Will there be any there with Valyrian heritage? Quite possibly. What we find out later in The Dance of the Dragons is that uh, because the, uh, the Valyrians were quite free in sharing their love with the small folk around them, shall we say, uh, there were a number of people in on Dragonstone and in the environs who had some Valyrian heritage. Uh, given that that seems to be their propensity, it makes absolute sense that some of the people they brought with them also shared that heritage. Uh, so, uh, yes, there will have been some, and I think we see the result of this in the Dragon Seeds. What... We we often think about just this Valyrian line or the Targaryen line as just being sort of very small and focused in, which it often is because they marry each other. But there are lots of illegitimate children out there, which means that there are lots of people who had uh, bits of Valyrian heritage to them. Um... A reflective rambling, uh, picking up again. Thank you. Picking up for Matt Savino. I've been watching your live streams for months now. Love them. Well, thank you. Um, how many Valyrian houses came to Westeros besides the Targaryens and the Valarions? Well, we hear of one more, House Celtigar on Claw Island. They're a much smaller house, but they are definitely an ally uh, with some Valyrian uh, heritage to them. Those three islands, Claw Island, Dragonstone, Driftmark, are the three in the mouth of the gullet, uh, and that was what the Valyrians wanted in order to be controlling trade um, into the into the gullet, into Essos and along the northern part of the the narrow sea um claw island um and house Celtigar, incidentally they we do get a little bit about them in the main story because uh, they have this relationship with cracklaw point which is that sort of uh, pointy bit <laughs> um it's the only way of saying it along the north of the the gullet um and uh, that they potentially pay homage to or theoretically pay homage to House Celtigar, but also the people there uh, submitted bent the knee direct to Visenya. So they have these kind of, they're, they're very loyal to the, the Valyrians, 
particularly the Targaryens, but the exact where in the Valyrians they owe their loyalty is sometimes a little bit uncertain. Uh, Donald People saying, I was this close to not starting from the beginning since I got here late. Thank the gods I did. Uh, thanks for the hooded nostalgia. You are very welcome uh, for the uh, the hooded nostalgia. Uh, Tom Butler saying, hey, Robert, sorry for the off-topic question. Do you think there could be another hammer of the waters that splits the north from the rest of Westeros? I don't know if this is an existing theory. It's just something I've thought of. Um, if you mean, was there a second one? Yes, lots of people have theorised this because we get the, the neck, which is clearly very marshy um, and it it makes sense. We get told lots of different stories about the Hammer of the Waters and it's one of these things because it is so far back in history, the Age of Heroes, um, earlier even, the Dawn Age, that George R. R. Martin tells us that we shouldn't just take literal truth of everything. But... One of the stories we get is that the Hammer of the Waters was cast from Moat Kaelin, which kind of makes sense if you're wishing to do it in the neck, because that's in the centre of the neck. So, yes, people have thought that this was the case. That has then led to lots of other people wondering, was this just like a second attempt to sort of cut off the south to prevent the... the uh, the march of the, the first men, or was it to try and prevent the march of the others heading south? Um, my my take is that I'm not 100% sure. I do, I, I oscillate a bit on this, but I don't think that they would have wished to cut off the Weirwood network to the south from what's happening in the north. Let's not forget the Isle of Faces in the, is in the south. The There are the Weirwood network appears not to be able to go under massive bits of water. It doesn't go over into Essos. I don't think they would have wanted to cut that off. So my my instinct is probably no. There was just the one hammer of the waters, which was the whatever happened to uh, to create the stepstones to get rid of the land bridge uh, down uh, between uh, Dawn and the disputed lands, or what became known later as the as the uh, disputed lands. Um, uh, mm, 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 mm. I think I had another question somewhere. Oh, yeah. So EP uh, saying, and I hope you picked up EP. I, I answered your question from last week uh, at the top of the show. So if you if you missed that, do do scroll back and uh, catch that. Uh, what do you think was the full extent of Oris and Aegon's relationship? Friends, brothers, or more. Thanks for all you do. Okay, so Oris Baratheon is a fascinating character because the Baratheons didn't start... We think at the moment the Baratheons, they're there in the storm's end. That's not where they started. Oris Baratheon, it was rumoured, was the half-brother, the illegitimate half-brother of Aegon the Conqueror. What we know is that they were firm friends from youth, and uh, the uh, he's probably the only we're, we're told that Aegon didn't have many friends. Uh, oh, everybody feels sorry for Aegon the Conqueror, but the the, the only person that he was really close, close to, male friend, was Oris Baratheon, uh, who he named his first hand in my strong right hand, the hand of the king. Um, so the question is what was the nature of the relationship there um i think they were brothers i think that that is very clear i think they were definitely friends were they more i think it's up to us to read into the the text any anything you want to there are echoes i think of the ned stark robert baratheon relationship here um but and, and there they're called more than brothers uh, that certainly seems to be the feel that we have between Aegon and uh, Oris. So I don't know. I, we we don't have any evidence. Uh, we don't. They were definitely very close. They were definitely, well, almost certainly, half brothers. Uh, Any more, I think, is just uh, the realms of speculation. Uh, question from. Uh, 
Uh, I think I just did that one uh, EP. Sorry, apologies. I'm just sort of trying to scroll through. I think I had another uh, question uh, maybe a little bit later. Uh, Cloaked One again, picking up one from Mike Hall. Thank you, Cloaked One. Thank you, Mike Hall. I always thought Aegon's procession through Westeros was a great way to maintain peace. It's a show of power, but also honours the visiting lords. Uh, why don't more kings rule this way? Um, yeah, so this is after the invasion. This was something that Aegon did very deliberately. He, he did a what's called a procession through for six months of the year often through Westeros. Now, this isn't just something George R. R. Martin has made up. This was something that medieval kings did a lot. Uh, it's uh, something Henry VIII, for example, used to do. He would do a procession uh, to visit noble lords. And you go around the country uh, bringing with you the royal court, and then you stop off at various palaces and halls and castles along the way and you stop there for a few days or a few weeks and you do some hunting and you have some feasts and then you move on now this is a mixed blessing for the people who you go and visit because it's a huge honor uh, it's obviously a chance to be hosting the king and the court and a chance to influence uh, but it's also hugely expensive because you're having to provide feasts you're having to um, provide entertainment and you have to show off. Uh, so uh, this is something which happened in real life. George R. R. Martin has shown it happened here. In uh, in uh, the history of the Targaryens, it's very clear that at least Jaehaerys took this very seriously and did it himself. Jaehaerys did processions, uh, progresses, uh, pr uh, progresses around the Seven Kingdoms. From the monarch's perspective, this... Um, created one-to-one -one relationships with people who weren't at court. What you'll find with Aegon is that he conquered everywhere, and then he could have just sat there in King's Landing and nobody would have seen him again. But he went all the way around the Seven Kingdoms, met all of his people. Uh, they got to see him, got to respect him. They got to, uh, to know him, and that actually cemented the personal relationships as well as the, the political ones. And also, incidentally, reminded people that he had a dragon. Um, here be dragons, talking of which. Uh, thank you very much, saying, uh, did someone say 300k? Yes, they did. Thank you very much. Congrats, Robert. Uh, it couldn't have happened to a more deserving people uh, person. Keep doing the thing. Thank you. I will I will keep doing the thing. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, Tom Butler saying, I meant a third uh, in order to possibly stop the others from going south. Uh, this could be a book version of the Northern Independence we got in the show. Um, so uh, a third, so this is a third, this is talking about the Hammer of the Waters. Uh, have people thought of there being a third Hammer of the Waters to stop the others going south? I think it's possible. What, what we have, and I'm sure I've said this before, but I don't think we can emphasize it much, we, uh, enough, what we have in terms of legends that we're told about the first long night is an incredibly incomplete set of tales. We get um, the tale of Azura High. We hear, hear so much more about the forging of his sword than what he did with the sword. That's We, we get the whole story about Nisa Nisa and uh, trying to uh, temper the sword here and there and everywhere. And what, what he did once he got it, couple of sentences that's it uh, then we get the last hero and he we get this this great epic story of him deciding that the, uh, the children of the forest must have the answer and we hear about the people he went with and his dog and his broken sword and then he got there and he got help and then they won and we don't actually get in any of these accounts a very clear understanding of what was actually done to defeat the uh, the others it seems to involve a flaming sword, it seems to involve the children of the forest and the magic of the children of the forest, but that's about it. Now, what was done? I personally don't think that a third Hammer of the Waters was part of this deal. Um, could they have done it? Possibly. They were a lot weaker than they were when they did it the first time around. Uh, but 
whatever they did got rid of the others, pushed them back, uh, meant that they did not bother humanity for millennia afterwards. Simply doing another hammer of the waters, a dividing wall in some way is not, uh, whether that's an actual literal wall or an area of water, is not, that's not the answer. That's not what happened. That's just a barrier preventing further southward progress. Uh, so maybe they did that to buy some time, but it's not really the solution. It's not what ended the long night. Um, and when they did create a barrier in the literal wall, uh, that was um, to prevent them coming back the next time, not the actual first time around. So it's possible, but that's not the answer to how they got rid of rid of the others in the first uh, the first time around. Um, OK, I think that's me caught up in the chat. So let's go to question from uh, Ariel Winchester saying, hey, Robert, one thing I'm curious about is what are your thoughts on Aegon's ambition? No other Targaryen had tried to invade Westeros before and had seemed uh, to have a very friendly relationship with some of the families. I don't believe it's just because he knew uh, it's because he knew about the White Walkers. Was it just a power grab? Well, let me just quickly address this issue of the White Walkers. This is something that came up. Um, years ago when fire and blood came out then there was released as part of the promotional material for this uh, an interview with george r, r. martin when he's talking about uh, fire and blood and there was a snippet from that which did the rounds where he says uh, some people have speculated that maybe aegon invaded westeros because he'd heard rumors about the white walkers or legends about them or something um, and that did the rounds. People said, oh, is this George R. R. Martin's telling us that maybe this was why they invaded? But that's not actually what George R. R. Martin was saying. He was talking in, uh, in world that some people have speculated that. So I think he's, he's not saying that that is why. And for my money, we'll come onto this in a moment or a bit later on. For my money, if he had been worried about the others, the return of the others, he would have gone north a huge amount earlier than he did. It took him uh, three decades to get north, to go north. Um, so if he, if the reason for his invasion was something to do with the others, he would have gone north a whole lot earlier to see what's going on. Um, so what was his reasoning? I think, I think we can overthink this. I think it was just a power grab. I think that he thought to himself that the Targaryens have a very, very high view of themselves, as we know. They think that they're born to rule. And having had three generations getting over the end of the Valyrian freehold, uh, and let's not forget friends, wider family will have died there. Um, once that has left, and the only people left of this completely new generation who had never known Valyria, they are probably the first generation that had never known Valyria or their parents weren't born in Valyria. They looked and thought, well, where should we go now? What are we doing now? We've got dragons. We haven't got any old elders. Uh, we don't, as far as we're aware, none of the generation above Aegon and his sisters were still alive. So their parents had died. What are they going to do? they go west. They think, you know what, we can rule this place. Why not? I think it's as simple as that. I think we can overthink it and try and come up with lots of other reasons. I think it's simply that the Targaryens felt that they were born to rule and the opportunity was there. Um, La Hack, Smaug versus Beleriand the Black Dread with a human rider. Who wins? Or how about all three versus Smaug? Just wondering out of curiosity. Um, I mean, this is a tough one because we can't really tell one 
a thing against another, but Valerian is always described as massive, I think, bigger than Smaug. Um, Smaug is not the biggest and baddest dragon that ever existed. There were some bigger and badder ones before him. He is the last of the great dragons, um, not the greatest of them all. Uh, so uh, I... I'm on a Game of Thrones live stream rather than the Lord of the Rings live stream. Maybe I'd come down the other side uh, there. I, I will say uh, if the three of them were against uh, Smaug, then I think that they would probably win. Uh, James T. Kirk saying, still think you look like a Baratheon. Uh, I'll, I mean, I'll take it. I'll, I'll take it. Um, I, I'd certainly look more like a Baratheon than I do a Targaryen, it has to be said. Um uh, Mr. E. Knight, isn't it said that uh, dragons may still remain near a shy? Interesting that Targaryens didn't gravitate in that direction post Doom, uh, finding it more familiar. So, yes, it's it's rumored there are no. We don't hear stories of dragons in the air uh, over there, but we don't hear many stories about what's going on over there at all. So, it's possible that there are still dragons beyond the shy uh, in the Shadowlands and beyond, but we we simply do not know. Why did the Valyrian, did the Targaryens not head back? Well, they couldn't go back to Valyria. Maybe they did go and have a look, see what was going on there. Um, but Dragonstone seems to have been the best place for the dragons. Dragons like heat uh, and... Valyria was the best place, but the other place with uh, seems to be sort of volcanic was Dragonstone. Uh, Dragonstone, as an island, it's got these vents of hot, gaseous air shooting up all the time. This is a really hot, it's a very really smelly island, but it's a really hot, a very sulfur, sulfurous, sulfurous smell. Uh, sulfurous? Uh, smell all the way across the island because it is basically volcanic so this is a good place for the dragons and it's a good place to stop if they weren't sure what they were doing or where they were going if they didn't have somewhere else to go that was better then they would probably stick to that uh donna daly um was aegon actually the most powerful sibling was he the decision maker well interesting so the the way the story is told in the world of ice and fire, yes. And the evidence that we have is that the, uh, the two sisters, at least we're happy for that to be the case, uh, perceived as the case. They crowned him. Visenya crowned him, that he had two crownings. The first one shortly after he landed, and the second one over in a couple of years later uh, that we were talking about in Old Town. The first one, Visenya crowned him and Rhaenys announced him as king. They were very clear that he was the king, and that was the impression that they wanted everyone to have. So I think um, the, the straightforward answer is yes, but the... It's clear that whereas Rhaenys was a lot more carefree, happy, enjoyed life, Visenya was a very, very strong character uh, with very clear views. Now, when you're asking if he was the strongest, uh, the most powerful sibling, I mean, they respected him and took his lead, is, is the evidence that we have. Even later on, when it was just the two of them, when we get the letter from Prince Nymor to, uh, to Aegon, which ended the the war with Dawn, uh, Visenya was all for carrying on the war, and Aegon uh, ended it, and she respected that. She didn't agree, but she respected that. So um, that was what they agreed between them. But it is noticeable that the, the three siblings all ruled he ha he was the titular head the titular uh king but he actually didn't spend huge amounts of time at king's landing on the iron throne he liked to spend time at dragonstone and he also went on these progresses around 
the, around Westeros. So most of the time he wasn't in King's Landing. And when he wasn't, one of the queens would sit there. Uh, so they actually all shared power. He was the, the head, but they all shared power. Uh, cloaked one, picking up one for Divine uh, Chareka. Who's your favourite Targaryen? Ooh, favourite Targaryen? Well, I mean, Bloodraven's the most fun, uh, in my view. Um, Egg is obviously great. Egg on the fifth is a, is a fantastic Targaryen. Um, I always quite like Queen Alison. She just seems generally to be a good character. She was good Queen Alison. She seems to actually care about people. Uh, so I like, I like them. Um, but uh, Breakspear as well, I think, came across particularly well. A great king who never was. So there are a few great Targaryens. Um, I don't think I have a, a other than Bloodraven, who I think is a wonderful character, even if not somebody that I would um, uh, call great in every sense of the word. Um, he's probably my favourite. Uh, Eric, the timeline confuses me. Seems like a lot happened in the first year. Landing, set up camp, different lords calling all banners and armies going around. Yes, so a lot did happen in the first year of the invasion. The invasion itself took about two years, we're told. Uh, the, and at the end of that two years, Aegon is crowned in Old Town. And by that time... Uh, the North, the Reach, the Westlands, the Riverlands, Stormlands, and the Vale have all bent the knee. So that was basically what happened in the first two years. Um, the, in terms of what happened quickly, yes, a lot happened. And this is, is what happens with invasions, it, it, that they had to take the initiative. If they just sort of sat there, having landed somewhere in... Um, in Westeros and just sort of sat there, it wouldn't be much of an invasion. They had to take the initiative uh, and dragons are a, they're a attack animals. They're not there sort of being to be defensive. They're there to take the attack to somebody else. So uh, yes, there was a lot that happened, uh, but dragons can cover a huge amount of uh, ground very quickly. Uh, and this was the game plan. You, Aegon clearly decided he wanted to show his power. And once he'd shown his power, then other people were uh, were more willing to bend the knee. Uh, Mara Lee, thank you. Picking up a question for James T. Kirk saying, um, if Aegon's conquest did not happen or did not succeed, do you think any one house would have taken up the mantle? Um, in terms of ruling over all seven kingdoms, certainly not in the next few years after that. No, the the what's noticeable is that yes, there were lots of battles back and forth, but there had now become some very established corners of Westeros. So the Starks held the north, and they had Moat Kaelin as the only. As, as covering the only way up to the north, it would have been really hard for anyone to take the north from them. The Vale is cut off from the west of uh, Westeros by the mountains, and the Eyrie is pretty much, uh, by, by normal means, by a normal army, you, you will not be able to take the Eyrie. Uh, similarly, the Westerlands, Castley Rock, we've not really seen it in books or, or much on the TV show, to be honest, but it... It's a, it's a massive rock. It's very easily defended. Dawn, similarly, very easy to defend. So what you have is a lot of these places, apart from the sort of the mushy middle ground around the, the, the riverlands and down into reach to a lesser extent, perhaps down into the stormlands, the, apart from there, the corners of the, uh, the Westeros were actually quite hard to invade. So it's not likely that there was anyone who was going to step forward and be able to take all of them. Because let's face it, the difference was the dragons. In every combat that they had, the difference was the dragons. People bent the knee to the dragons, not just because there was somebody with a big army, because they started off with a very small army. Uh, 
Uh, Jack Myatt saying, just a little extra as a show of true thanks. Uh, you're well, thank you. Um, will Aegon's legacy be alive at the end of A Song of Ice and Fire? Will the Seven Kingdoms be united? Can we expect some Varys content soon? He's my favourite character. Varys content. Um, yeah, maybe. I, I haven't done much Varys stuff recently. You're right. I Perhaps, perhaps I should. Um, uh, I'll add it to the list. In terms of will the Seven Kingdoms still be alive and around after... Song of Ice and Fire. Yes, probably. I mean, I could certainly see the the way that the show went with the the North seceding. I could see that happening. That makes sense. Um, I could also see the Iron Islands seceding. Maybe even Dawn. Uh, some of these the the extremities, but the main bulk of it will be so decimated by war that if a strong ruler comes to the fore, then I think people are just, they're not going to be fighting. They're not going to want to fight. This is then going to be a matter of, uh, okay, that's all done. Let's just, in, in whatever political configuration we have at the moment, let's just carry on. That's the kind of feel. I don't think we're going to get this uh, massive shakeup of uh, breaking down into seven kingdoms once more. I think there will be a ruler at the end of it. Um, who will rule over Westeros, greater or lesser. Um, so exactly what that covers is a, is a matter for some speculation, but Westeros broadly. Um, I think that's me caught up on the chat. So uh, let's go to question from Dan McKay. Uh, the physical characteristics of the Valyrians are notable with their silver hair and purple eyes. I think the other races present in Westeros at the time of the invasion, the descendants of the First Men, the Andals, the Rhoynar, also had their own typical characteristic looks. Can you remind me? Um, bonus question, if possible, did the Valyrians also have the typical personality traits different from the other races or were the distinctions we, um, we are aware of just limited to the physical realm? Okay, so in terms of physical distinctive characteristics for the different um, races, the First Men, uh, the, the Rhoynar, the, uh, the Andals, the, the Rhoynar had uh, what what we might think of as Dornish looks. This is actually what Arya, when she encounters Ned Dane, uh, and he doesn't look typically Dornish, she says, hey, I thought all Dornish people had uh, dark hair and olive-coloured skin. And he goes, yeah, not all of them. We're all a little bit different. Uh, but that's because he wasn't descended from the Rhoynar. So the Rhoynar did come in with the dark hair, uh, olive-coloured skin. Um, as for the First Men and the Andals, we're not told huge amounts of difference between them, so it appears that any differences weren't huge, but the Andals were talked about as being fair-haired. So if you think about it, most of the First Men have that kind of Nord Starkish look, darker hair, maybe brown hair, grey eyes, that kind of thing. Um, whereas the families that have got more of an Andal heritage are much more likely to have uh, fair hair. So that's the only real sort of difference we got. In terms of personalities, the, I, I'm a subscriber to the theory that the Valyrian dragon riders have got a hint of dragon uh, DNA spliced into them uh, through some uh, ancient gene magic that the Valyrians did, blood magic. Um, now, this undeniably does affect their personality. It's not quite as clear-cut as the you know, the gods flip a coin with half of them are good and half of them are crazy. That's not what George R. R. Martin would want us to be thinking, but it's very clear that there is this dragonish element to most of the Targaryens, which actually means that we can move beyond. I think we can move in a kind of interpretive sense beyond this idea of some of them being mad or crazy. 
but it's just slightly more dragonish. Dragons don't feel the need to apologize. They just go and take what they want. They kill, they burn. That's what they do. And that's perfectly natural for drows without the burning. Um, and so if there's a bit of dragonish DNA in the Targaryens, if they do those things, that's actually natural for them. It's not mad. It might be from a human perspective, but that's what it is. They're just a little bit more dragonish. Um, Karis the Beast, uh, or Karis the Beast, um, it rhymes. Can you give us some history of the relationship between Rhaenys and Visenya? The age difference has to play a large role in how they relate to each other. Yeah, so uh, Rhaenys and Visenya, the two queens, sisters, Visenya the older, Rhaenys the younger. They have very different characters. Visenya is serious. She's very warlike. Um, she's very direct. And Rhaenys, a lot more relaxed, fun-loving. She laughs. She rides her dragon for just for pure enjoyment. Um, and she likes music and the arts. Um, Aegon married Visenya. That appeared to have been the tradition, marrying the eldest daughter, uh, the eldest sister, and then he married Rhaenys. Now this, although without precedent, or although with some precedent, apparently, wasn't normal still uh, for Targaryens to be marrying more than one of their sisters. Um, and it's said that Aegon uh, married Visenya out of duty and then married Rhaenys out of love. And he certainly seemed to spend more time with Rhaenys than Visenya. So in terms of the relationship between those two women, they seem to be very, very different in terms of personality, but also very, very committed to each other as part of the Targaryens. When Rhaenys is killed, Visenya goes uh, on a killing blitz with Aegon all the way across Dawn, uh, and their, their anger is absolute. So she clearly cares about Rhaenys, even though they're very different. So uh, the... The, the relationship with, it, it sort of teases out a little bit um, that they both they both had a child with Aegon, uh, but rumours were that Visenya had to get a little bit of magical help to get hers. Um, so if there were any kind of real problems, yes, there, might, there are some niggles and they disagreed on certain things, but if there were any real relationship problems, they actually kept them well hidden because they had a shared caring and love and affection for each other as part of the family, and also because they felt that that's what needed to happen. Um, question from Isaac McCardle saying, hello, Robert, really happy to be a new Patreon. So, uh, supporting one of the best channels on YouTube. Well, thank you. Welcome to Patreon. Um, and this gives me the perfect opportunity to say that if you do wish to support this channel, uh, the very best way of doing that is to join my Patreon. There is a link down in the description. Uh, I'm sure one of the wonderful moderators will put a link in the chat if you're watching this live. Um, for those who don't know Patreon, it's just a way of supporting creators. So you'll find me there. But many of your favorite creators, not just on YouTube, but uh, on many, 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 many other ways uh, of creating podcast creators, writers, artists, musicians, you'll find lots of people on Patreon. And it's a way of supporting the people who you wish uh, to just give a helping hand to. So uh, if you wish to support this channel, um, that is the best way to do it. Patrons, thank you. I say it a lot. I always mean it. I cannot do what I do without your support. Uh, so thank you. I hugely appreciate it. That's why I do things like uh, prioritizing questions from my patrons on these live streams. 
just as a little way of thanking you and giving a little bit of something back as well. Um, but the question is, I'd like to know what Dragonstone was like preceding Aegon's invasion. For example, I've read that he and his army landed on the east of Westeros, but where did he get his army from? What was the hustle and bustle like at Dragonstone? And was it only House Targaryen that was stationed there? The show painted it as a largely desolate and sometimes completely vacant place where a few characters would brood over invading Westeros. But I'm willing to bet in Aegon's time, in canon of books, it was a pretty different place. It, well, yes, it, it was always desolate. It was always grim uh, and it was never hugely populated. Those things said, it's mostly a castle, and there is, on the show, they didn't, it was just a castle, really, with a little dock. In in the books, it has, there's a town, there's a port town there, um, there's a, a thriving population, uh, but, um, and obviously, the castle also has a thriving population, because you don't just have the, the rulers living there, you have all the support staff, effectively, the uh, the servants who live up and around the castle. So, yes, this is a bustling place, lots of people doing lots of things. They had a small standing army. They also had, uh, in terms of the original invading force, they had House Flarion on Driftmark, they had uh, House Keltigar and a couple of other houses, House Crab, I think, uh, from Cracklaw Point. And that army... The combined army from them was what landed uh, in what became King's Landing. Now, that was not a big army. The, there are reports, one report said it was 3,000, another report says it was a few hundred. This, is, this was a small army. By anyone's count, this is a small army. The strength was not in the army. The strength was in the navy from the House of Larion and in the Three Dragons. That was what won invasion, not the army. It grew, and Aegon's slice of genius in this was to uh, give everybody to be magnanimous. If you bend the knee, then I'm not going to hold it against you. Whatever you've done, you're on my side now. Uh, and whenever he took an area and somebody bent the knee, he said, right, back up on your feet. You can be the lord of there. Uh, I need your army to help me finish the rest of this war. And so every time he won a battle, his army expanded. Um, question from uh, Mara Lee. Picking one up for Carl Karsnark. Uh, Carl, thank you. And Mara, thank you. Uh, in honour of reaching 300k subscribers, a completely non-related Song of Ice and Fire question. What gave you the courage or impetus to make your first YouTube video? Um, uh, well, this is a question I've not been asked for a while, actually. Uh, this is, and then I will, very thank you very much, and I will happily answer this for anyone who is thinking about doing this. Um, so I, uh, I happened to be at a point in my life when I, I had a little bit of time, and... Uh, I, as we all do, was just watching a few YouTube videos. I saw a few YouTube videos about things that I enjoyed, uh, and I thought, I'll give that a go. Um, and that was it. Uh, I literally typed into Google, how do you make a YouTube video? And I went from there. That's, that's the starting point. I've not got, for those who are uh regular on this channel uh will be very aware i've not got huge technical skills i'm very excited when i can get things like this green screen working um i went into it without uh, any particular skills in video editing or anything like that if you watch any of my early videos you will see that um but i just trusted in the content of what i was producing uh and went to went with the principle of every time you make a video you make it slightly better uh and i that's what i'd say to anyone who is considering do, doing this just give it a go you don't have to have a bank of great skills to start with the hardest thing to do is make your first video and put it out there uh, and i can still remember to this day that i 
I put my um, my first video. I didn't actually tell anyone I did this all in one day, and I and I, uh, I loaded it up before I went to bed. Didn't tell anybody at all, no family or friends or anything. And I woke up the next morning, and I had it had been watched three times. Uh, and I got one subscriber, <laughs> and I can't remember who that one subscriber was, but bless you, whoever you were, uh, it made me go, wow, so this this can work. People do just watch random videos. Uh, so then I just carried on uh, producing videos from that point. And the, the other thing that I would just sort of say is that um, my original, you asked about my original impetus. I said I was in a Reflective mood. I am in a reflective mood. Uh, apologies if you're here just for some of and fire content. I will get back to that in just one second. Uh, the, my the, the original idea for this for me came from I used to work with some very intelligent people, um, and uh, this was back when Sherlock was on. I don't know if you remember Sherlock, uh, great TV show, um, but was very fast paced. Um, and had a lot of different references to things going on all over the place. I used to work, as I say, with some very intelligent people, uh, but as is everywhere in the world, we met around the water cooler and just everyone had was talking about the show. That was the show that we all watched. Uh, and people would be asking, I didn't quite catch that. Why, why was that? You know, my baby was crying and I missed what was happening over there. And then somebody else would say, um, I've not read... I've not read the books. Did that happen in the books? And then someone else would sort of uh, would answer and say, yes, that did happen. Uh, but there was also that reference over there. Did you spot that reference over there? And it just made me realize that there was what I, I thought something that I could do was to be the friendly geek, to be the person who didn't try and talk down to people, assume that everyone uh, is intelligent viewers, uh, taking it, everything on board, but we we can't all possibly have the time to have read all of the books. We can't all possibly have time to uh, to know all of the detail about absolutely everything to pour over things. And and maybe what maybe what those people wanted was a friendly geek who could give them that extra layer of insight, tell them what reference that little thing over there was, what that Easter egg was all about, what that uh, connection there that they just missed because they happen not to be paying attention at that precise moment was um and just be a fan alongside people but with the extra layer of knowledge behind so that was my that was my original impetus and that's largely stuck with me through this is that i i want uh i want to always assume that people are intelligent viewers who just want somebody who can enjoy it with them and also perhaps join up a few dots that they, for whatever reason, didn't um, uh, didn't connect at the time. So uh, that's the history. Thank you for that, um, Carl Carlson. As I say, good time to be uh, to be reflective. Um, uh, anyway, question from Mara Lee. Uh, why was Dawn such a difficult place to conquer? Now, this is fascinating because Dawn was. As we've already said that the first bit of the invasion it worked well. Two years was actually a quite short time to completely take over a continent. Then the Iron Islands fell over. It took 150 years, a bit more, to for Dawn to finally join uh, the Seven Kingdoms. And even then it only did it on its own terms. There were 13 years of, of trying to uh, attack Dawn, conquer Dawn, burn Dawn, uh, it, and, and none of it worked. Why? I think there are a few answers. One of them, I think, is the fact that the Dornish knew their terrain hugely well. One was that they were willing to, uh, with a leader that was not willing to back down. Uh, and another... I think is that they they had experience of fighting dragons, which is something that cultural experience, not those people personally, but the Roinar, who were across in Dawn, this is where House Martel came from, it's House Nymeros Martel, the, the, the Roinish had hundreds of years of experience of fighting dragons, and they knew how to fight against dragons. And that was something that no Westerosi had experience of maybe some of the Andals have had a little bit of 
experience of millennia ago, but uh, generally speaking, no. And the one dragon which did fall in those battles was in Dawn, and it was killed in the same way that dragons we know were killed in uh, in the wars, in the wonderfully named Turtle Wars and the Spice Wars and, and things like that between the Roinar and the, the Valerians, uh, which is by arrow fire, by scorpion bolts, things like that. That was, yes, others may have tried shooting at dragons, but this clearly was the tactic the Dornish used because they knew it worked and the, the Westerosi weren't setting themselves up uh, for that battle. They were setting themselves up for fighting armies. Uh, Argilac, the arrogant, just charged at his opponents. The, the, the field of fire, two huge houses, they were delighted when they realised that they outnumbered the army of the, the Targaryens, and so they charged at them, and then the dragons just burned them. They were not ready to be fighting, facing dragons. They had not built a plan to be facing dragons. The Dornish had got a plan to be facing dragons. Uh, Donna Daly, do you think that the dragons were spliced with human blood? Just wondering if that could be a reason why Valerians married family members. Um, uh, so if you're asking whether, so I've, I've said that the Valerians had some dragon blood within them. Did the dragons have some Valerian blood? And we, we don't, we don't talk about that much, but it makes sense, doesn't it? That, that actually the, the link is there both ways. And so this is why dragons can be connected to humans, not just because the humans are connected to dragons. Um, uh, is that, uh, in terms of the second part of there, a reason why they married family members? I mean, possibly uh, it's it's the way, but I think that the, the Valerians as a whole seem to be very, very strong on... Uh, retaining the purity of their bloodline is probably, I mean, it's a horrible phrase, but that seems to be what, what it was. You get the the Volantine, the people in Volantis, uh, the, who are behind the black walls of Volantis, who consider themselves the heirs of Valeria. That's because they claim to have unbroken um, heritage back to the Valerians they're not going to sully their um, their bloodline by marrying outside of that. Similarly, the Targaryens. And the Targaryens, um, if anything, they wanted to have an even purer bloodline because the, it wasn't just Valyrians uh, who were dragon riders. Not, not all Valyrians were dragon riders. Only the main families. There were dragon riding families, the top tier of Valyrian society. And House Targaryen one, one of them. So those were the ones who had the dragon link, not the lower tier like House Valarion, House Kalthgar and the like. They did not, they were Valyrian, but they did not have the dragon link. So House Targaryen were marry, intermarrying with themselves because they wished to retain that draconic heritage. Um, Hibby Dragon saying, Lord Robert in Deep Geek, uh, law master of the water cooler, keeper of the sacred Easter eggs and references. Well, thank you. I, I will take that. Um, uh, I think that's me caught up on the chat. Um, there are, I should say, there's a lot. I can see there's a lot of very nice things people are saying in the chat today. Thank you very much. I'm not, I'm not picking up on everything, I will pick up on some more things. Uh, later on, but I do want to get through uh, the questions from my patrons. Uh, Dan McKay, could the invasion have failed? Is there any way, looking back with hindsight, or was it a foregone conclusion the moment Aegon decided to conquer? I think uh, foregone conclusion is the wrong way of saying it. I, I think that the once they decided to go there and they got their plan, they there was no weapon that was anywhere near the match of the dragons. So 
this they were overwhelming favorites even if the people they opposed did not think that they were overwhelming favorites is there any way they could have lost yes of course there were always ways that you could lose i think we may well find that there's a way that danny can lose uh invading a continent with three dragons we'll have to see what happens there are there are there ways that they could lose that don't involve uh the others attacking from the north and maybe um magic users from the iron, iron islands having dragon binder um uh, yes We've seen one, we were talking a moment ago, we've seen that Dawn had a way of killing dragons. In fact, that last great uh, ruinish battle that we talked about last time, they killed, there were three dragons. I mean, George Martin does like echoes, that three dragons came against the Ruinar and they shot two of them down and the other one they injured and they had to fly, they had to fly away. The, if there were just three dragons up against uh, the Dornish, there's a chance they could have got them. There is a chance. They got one. They might have got the other ones as well. Um, not a big chance, but there was a chance. And and, and all of these things uh, in in war, I mean, you probably know the, the rhyme for the, uh, for the want of a uh, the want of a nail and the the horse's hoof was lost for the want of horse's hoof, and the horse was lost for the want of a horse. Then the uh, platoon was lost for the want of a platoon. Then the war was lost. That that kind of thing is that there are small things can change uh, battles and wars. The other thing which could have changed it is not getting killing all three dragons, but what if different Targaryens had been killed? Rhaenys was killed the other two Targaryens were going to carry on. Visenya was never going to admit defeat at all. Uh, Aegon eventually accepted a draw with Dawn. Um, he accepted peace. So if it had been Visenya who died first and it was left with Aegon and Rhaenys, would they have carried on the war as, as long? Probably not. Uh, if... Visenya and Aegon had gone, and it was just Rhaenys, would she have carried on? Probably not. So it's it's all of these things, it's a matter of uh, these things could have happened, they didn't. The, the fact is that the Targaryens were overwhelming favourites the moment that they got the dragons across, but not 100% certain. Uh, Alejandro Martinez, to kind of piggyback on some of the themes in the earlier questions, uh, I know what few children of the forest remained in Westeros were probably in the deep forests of the north or north of the wall but by the time the Valyrians began to settle on Dragonstone. That being said, I can't help but feel a little sympathetic towards the children. It's like one more blow to what little remained of their culture and history by yet another group of outsiders. This time the outsiders settling the only or main source of obsidian in Westeros. It's no wonder that the South forgot. I know that's not a question, but I just wanted to put it out there. Um, yeah, it's not a question, but it's a really interesting, I'm very happy to um, talk about this for a little bit, because it's, it's a question not often asked, but I think it has quite big implications, is where did the children of the forest get their dragon glass from? Now, why is that important? Because this was their main, this was where their weapons came from, this was a large part of their culture, was dragonglass. And dragonglass seems to be frozen fire, seems to come from um, volcanic activity. So we know that there's lots of it under dragonstone. Is there somewhere else that they got it from? We know that there's some over in a shy area because they export it from over there. But we don't really hear about any other places in um, in Westeros where this comes from. So if they, who was there on Dragonstone to start with when the Targaryens took over? Uh, were there children of the forest there? We're not 
told that there were. We're not told anything about who was there beforehand. It doesn't seem to be the kind of place where a weirwood tree would happily be growing. Uh, but at the same time, that's where the dragon glass is. Did this cut them off from their only or main supply of dragon glass? It's possible because we don't know where else it might have come from. And also on the show, they had that. I mean, at the time we thought, oh, this seems really significant. It didn't really turn into anything. But they they had that time when John and Danny go into the dragon glass mines underneath Dragonstone and they see those cave drawings. The implication was that this was from the children of the forest and the children of the forest had been here a long time ago. Um, had they? We, we don't know. It, it's, it's entirely possible that they had. And if so, when did they abandon it? Uh, when was it taken over? Who held it before the Targaryens came in uh, or the Valyrians came in? These are questions that are simply not answered. Um, in any event, the biggest source of dragonglass was gone when Dragonstone was gone. Um, question from Ben. The first two invasions, uh, this being, um, I think, the, uh, the Roinar and you were talking about the Roinar and the uh, Andal invasions. The first two invasions brought cultural changes. Why didn't at least the upper classes become a little more Valyrian in their outlook and fashion afterwards? Well, this is, um, I think, uh, a result of what kind of invasion they were. So both the Andal invasion um, and the, the Roinar, these were quite long and slow invasions by a lot of people. This was, And this was not just... Um, an army coming over this was people coming over to colonize so what happened in both cases was a lot of intermarriage the families that were there uh, when the andal invasion happened they just married in with the andals the first men married in with the andals and carried on similarly we have down in dawn the martels married uh, uh the Nymeria married into the martels so the what you have is a cultural blending. That wasn't what happened with the Targaryens. The Targaryens came in. There were just the three of them to start with. And they said, we're now ruling. <laughs> we're in charge. They're not marrying anyone else. Uh, they had children. And yes, the children sometimes, and then a few generations down, did marry outside of the Targaryens, but as much as was possible, they stayed married in to their own family, to within their own culture. So you have a difference between uh, an invasion, a long, slow invasion, where the main focus was on intermarriage and colonization, and the Targaryen invasion, which was just about ruling. And it wasn't about... Um, uh, connecting with the people they're marrying into it. In fact, the Targaryens saw themselves as above other people, different, better. Uh, they didn't wish to uh, marry others if they could possibly get away with it. Uh, Coach Ballerina, do you think Aegon has true heirs? Um, uh, and for Divine uh, Chereka, where did Beleriand forge the Iron Throne? In the Red Keep? Um, well, I'll, I'll answer the second one there. So the Iron Throne was uh, forged at King's Landing. King's Landing, uh, as a city, emerged over the course of decades, uh, not immediately. There, there was not anywhere there to start with. Then there was the Aegon Fort. That was the first thing that happened, which was this wooden fort on top of a hill. The hill was Aegon's Hill, which then was where the Red Fort was built afterwards. Uh, but this was Magor the Cruel who finished off the actual Red Keep as we know it. Uh, so that, that happened later. The, the Iron Throne itself was forged there. The, the, we're told that the swords were shipped down the river uh, to there and that's where it got forged um as for whether um aegon had any um what did what did you say any heirs um 
Well, this builds on the idea that perhaps neither of his children were actually his. Um, we had um, we had two, Rhaenys and Visenya, both had a child. Um, and in both instances, there's potential to um, doubt whether or not Aegon is the father. Um, Rhaenys was, uh, she allegedly had lots of other lovers, the the, the musicians, the archetypes, uh, and Visenya didn't have uh, any children with Aegon, but then sort of flew off and allegedly performed dark arts. And then um, uh, she did get a child and that child was uh, Maegor the Cruel. So, uh, which sort of backs up the idea of someone being bought, uh, brought into this world via black arts. Personally, I, George R. R. Martin has left it deliberately open. So I don't think we can draw full conclusions either way, but I don't see categorical evidence that either of them were not his children. I, it's uh, maybe they weren't, but certainly the the Targaryen bloodline seems to have carried on. That they were. That was the Targaryen household. Those three, uh, and the Targaryen line appears to have carried on very happily down uh, with the Targaryen look and the Targaryen uh, genetic inheritance through them. So. For me, it seems most likely that they were Aegon's, but they, they, both are open to doubt. Uh, I, the one thing I would say about Visenya is I don't think we should take what the maesters say as um, when it comes to magic users, and particularly female magic users, um, as being particularly objective. They all the way through fire and blood and all the way through uh, the world of ice and fire, if there's a, a woman that they wish to um, degrade in some way, then they call her a witch or say she dealt in black magic. Uh, if there is a woman who is a, a magic user, then it's never a positive thing. It's always a bad thing. Uh, so they, uh, if, Visenya used magic, then they would see this as a bad thing, and this might be leading to the bad king. So I think we just have to take it with a bit of a pinch of salt. Uh, Chris Smedia saying, congrats on 300k. Thank you. Um, unrelated, but must ask. My theory is that Craster is Bloodraven's son. What implications could this have for Gilly's son? If sacrificed, could they unknowingly be using King's blood? Um... Yeah, I, so I at some point I will do a Craster Who is Craster video. It's on my long list. I I tend to the view that Craster isn't anybody special. I think that we've um, uh, because he appears um, quite centrally quite early on. And because he's the only person who seems to have any kind of relationship with the others, he gains this kind of importance in our minds. But the reality is that he didn't actually seem to have a relationship with the others. He just sacrificed stuff to the what he called the cold gods. Uh, and if he had a child, a male male child, a son, they would do that. If not, a sheep. It wasn't. It wasn't a pact that he came and they didn't sign the two sides of it, sign it up and say, well, "This is what I'm going to provide once a year. You can come along here and I'll give you a son." It wasn't anything like that. This was just an established custom by the wildlings that sometimes they would leave children out uh, for uh, the the cold gods, and he uh, was just uh, weird <laughs> and and. Uh, he wished to keep all his daughter wives around and no sons. And once he got into the habit, it became a whole lot easier. So um, I think we place too much emphasis on him myself. Um, I think probably he was the son of a, a um, member of the Night's Watch. I'm not sure it particularly works that it was Bloodraven. I don't think that the idea of Bloodraven just 
randomly having a child north of the wall doesn't really seem to work. That doesn't fit in with my idea of his timeline. Uh, he was quite old as well at that point. Let's not forget. Um, so, yes, it's possible. Um, but I don't think it's likely. Um, but I will try and do a video about that one at some point. Um, but what implications would it have for Gilly's son? Um, if sacrificed, could they unknowingly be using King's blood? Um, yeah, well, so, yes. But, but does blood, would Blood Raven, um, a bastard child of the king, his son, um, a bastard son's bastard son, be have King's blood? Yes, but not much. <laughs> um, so it's, um, I, I mean, I like the thinking. I, I really do like the thinking, but I don't think the, the link to King's blood is that strong, um, I have to say. Um, um, Ms. Ritzai saying, long time viewer, love what you do. Any chance of earlier live streams to cater for your African viewers? Caught this live stream because of insomnia, but I know I'm not alone. Uh, well, first of all, welcome, African viewers. Um, in terms of earlier live streams, uh, and I hope you get over your insomnia. I get told that my voice can send people to sleep, so uh, I hope that works for you. Um, in terms of earlier live streams, I found this as a regular live stream uh, time works if people know when it's going to be. Uh, but I do try, um, I haven't for a while, I know, uh, but to do other random ones at earlier times, uh, particularly when there is TV shows on and things like that. Uh, so yes, I will try and I will add it back into my list of things to, to do. I'm aware there are some people, no time would work for everyone. I'm very aware of that. This, this works, um, I think, reasonably well for East Coast America, not too bad for the UK, rest of Europe. It's a, an hour later. Uh, Africa, obviously, depends on where you are in Africa, uh, the timeline. Um, but yeah, I'll add it in. Uh, but uh, thank you very much for the super chat. I will, I will see what I can do. Um, question from Sebastian Schumawa. Um, and thank you, by the way, for giving me the, the name pronunciation. I'm Names are important, so I, I do try my best to uh, to pronounce names. Uh, and but I know I'm also very forgetful, and I will probably forget how to pronounce that if you if your name comes up again. Uh, but thank you very much for telling me this time. Um, Saying so I have a question that relates to invading Targaryens, dragons, and dragons in general. We know that Balerion and Vagar were incredibly massive but other dragons that came after them were never near their size. Do you think that something else rather than simply wars and dying in battle has happened to them? You had a theory that the maesters were responsible for the dragon's extinction, but was there something else? Did the doom of Valyria and possibly uh, some huge part of magic leaving the world because of that have possibly something to do with this? Or was someone or something else like Bravos involved? Uh, by the way, as a graphic art, uh, designer myself, I'm very excited about the visual changes you've announced. Um, can't wait to see your channel grow even bigger. Well, thank you. Yes, so the uh, this is the the branding. Um, final touches are being made. Keep an eye out for the branding at some point in the next couple of weeks, I hope. Um, one of the range of behind-the-scenes things I've been doing over the last few months just to try and sort of raise the game a little bit. But... Um, the question about dragons. Let's let's talk about let's talk about the life cycles of dragons. So in the the world of ice and fire, it's very clear that dragons keep growing through their lives. In in natural in a natural state, if they're out, they're not penned up. Nothing bad happens to them. Uh, if they've got enough to eat, they will keep growing through their lives. They will get fiercer. They will get bigger. Uh, their flames will get hotter. Uh, eventually, they do get more sluggish um, and sleep more and things like that when they get into dragony old age. But through their lives, they do just keep on 
growing. So that's the general life cycle of the dragon. Um, what is I find quite interesting, and I'm, I'm very happy to be contradicted on this if people can find another example, but I think that the only dragon that we're told about the entire life cycle of from beginning up to end and actually see them have a natural end, not killed in some way, not potentially poisoned by maesters, if you buy into that theory, um, is Balerion. All the other dragons are killed in some way. Uh, die early in some way. So Balerion is the only one that we actually see this whole life cycle. And Balerion is very old. Um, Balerion came across with the uh, the Targaryens and was then from Valeria and was then, so we don't know how old Balerion was at the time, then was on... Uh, Dragonstone for a hundred years, uh, then was with the um, Targaryens for over a hundred years after that. So it's there's a fair chance that we've got maybe a 300-year-old dragon. Who knows? This is a very old dragon and has been growing through all that time. The other dragons also were growing, but most of the other dragons we see were killed in the Dance of the Dragons or uh, in the... Dornish invasion or attempt at invasion of Dawn, uh, or in the years after the uh, the Dance of the the Dragons, where we get uh, dragons with stunted growth. That's the point at which I believe the Maesters started getting involved. The other dragons, there are some other dragons uh, that, uh, and I'm sure maybe they're going to people will point this out in the comments. There are some other dragons uh, that we know of, like Cannibal or sheep stealer who aren't killed, but they sort of disappear off stage somewhere. Cannibal presumably just died in the cave on Dragonstone, and we just don't know about it. Um, sheep stealer disappeared into the Mountains of the Moon, and we don't hear from again. Again, presumably died at some point, because we don't hear about a dragon um, uh, flying around there in the present story and not for a long time. So there are a couple of other dragons which are out there, but we don't really hear about the rest of their story. So so that's what I think was going on, was that we get only one real dragon that we see live all the way through its life cycle. And most of the other dragons die. And then after the Dance of the Dragons, that's when we get the um, dragons only living for a few years or dying very, very young. Um, uh, Lindsay Petrchok uh, saying, Hi Robert, I think Visenya's smartest move during the invasion was a flying um, her dragon right to the Eyrie. It was a bloodless way to win over an entire kingdom. Do you agree? And what were Aegon's and Rhaenys' smartest moves? Yes, so I think yeah, I would agree. Uh, I've mentioned already, so this is what Visenya did and won the, the veil without uh, a, a single uh, bullet being fired or, or, or sword being drawn. This was um, a very clever, canny thing to do. Uh, Rhaenys, um didn't really have a, a moment like that, uh, but in the one big battle that she was involved in, the one at Storm's End, what she did do was survey the ground first and use that intelligence. So she effectively went up above the battlefield first, saw where all the enemies were, got the reconnaissance done, came down, and then told Oris Baratheon, and he arranged his troops accordingly. Uh, and that probably was what ultimately won the battle, because uh, Argilac was a great warrior, and he did have a lot of very good soldiers. And there was a lot of the heavy rain at the time, which meant that uh, the dragon couldn't fly again. Uh, so that kind of aerial threat was no longer there. So everything was actually potentially on uh, the Storm King's side, uh, but for the fact that they knew where he was going, knew where he was coming from, they knew where all 
sort of forces he had, and they can actually arrange their forces correctly. So that's probably her greatest opponent. For Aegon, I think, well, I think there are a couple. Undoubtedly, Harren Hall was the moment that made everybody just stop and go, okay, so that's what a dragon can do. And it was, um, although, yes, the, he, he melted a castle and it wasn't just uh, Harren the Black who was there, there would have been all of the, the servants and, and everyone else there, so there would have been a lot of other random casualties. This was this was not a uh, simply a matter of, of killing an army in the field. This definitely had a huge amount of civilian casualties along with it, but it definitely shortened the war because it showed particularly the armies of the north as they came south, what the dragon could do, and that prevented further bloodshed. But I think the moment of, and I don't know whether you call it genius, other people have done this, but he stuck by it, and that clearly was, the for me, the big thing which won Egg on the War and the smartest move was to say up front and stick to this idea of if you bend the knee, I will forgive you and put you back in place. Because the moment that he said that he and showed it happened after his first battle, it happened with the Starks, it happened with um, uh, even the Lannisters. The Lannisters had opposed him, uh, fought a battle against him, but then they bent the knee. The moment that he starts to show that this will happen every time, all you have to do is bend the knee, that allows people to have a proper option. They're not just fighting because this is a fight for survival. They know that they can retain their position and power, albeit not the title of king, uh, if they do not fight. And that allowed people like the High Towers, for example, just to go, okay, open the gates, you can come in. <laughs> That's fine. The moment that you, you allow people that way out, it cuts off huge amounts of potential wars. So I thought that that's probably his smartest move. Uh, and it it allowed him to uh, have a, a huge base of supporters uh, very, very quickly. Um, Londok 20. Uh, how did the Targaryens view bastards during the conquest? Most rulers would have been offended by the North sending Brandon Snow to negotiate, but it didn't seem to bother Aegon at all. What are your thoughts? Also, it's said that Torrin knelt to Aegon near the Trident. So when was the first time the Targaryens actually travelled to the north? Um, well, in terms of viewing bastards, yeah, absolutely, he seemed to be completely fine with it. The the way, as you say, that, that it happened with the Starks was the Stark army came south and we get Brandon Snow, the bastard brother of Torrin Stark. He initially wanted to shoot the dragons with some... Uh, Think weirwood arrows. Um, maybe that would have worked. I'll never know. Maybe we'll find out in a song of ice and fire. But um Torren decided actually to send him over to do a little bit of negotiating. Aegon happily negotiated with him. Once they come to an agreement, Torren came up and, and met and bent the knee. So uh was he okay with it? Clearly he was okay with it, and probably because his best friend was a bastard. Horace Baratheon. So he actually was fine with it. He thought this was just a normal and natural part uh, of, uh, of who you have by your side and your most trusted advisor. His most trusted advisor, his hand of the king, was his bastard brother. So, of course, he would uh, be happy to deal with Torren Stark's bastard brother. He would just think that would work fine. Um, as for the second thing, when did the Targaryens first travel to the north? Well, the north as a whole, we don't know. We're not told exactly everywhere that um, Aegon went, and went on each of his different progresses. But in terms of visiting Winterfell, we are told that on his last progress, he visited even Winterfell. Uh, and the clear implication was that this was the first time he went. That was the year 33 AC. So that was 35 years after stepping, setting foot on Westeros uh, to launch his invasion. The, the, the year zero is when he was crowned in Old Town, um, which I think just adds to the very clear notion that this he didn't, he didn't invade Westeros because he wanted to see what was happening at the wall. 
as far as we know, he never even went to the wall. Uh, he certainly didn't go to Winterfell for um, you know, three and a half decades. It, this was not a priority for him. So, um, yeah, it's uh, he he took quite a hands off approach, as most of the kings did. Frankly, took quite a hands off approach when it came to the north. Uh, as long as the Starks were playing ball, they were accepting the fact that they were lords paramount. They weren't kings anymore. He largely left them alone. Um, uh, Luke um, Morano, perhaps, um, saying, I'm behind on the stream, so I don't know if this was already discussed, but do you believe Magor and Anus are really Aegon's children? Thanks for the content, by the way. Uh, yes, this has already been discussed. I discussed this half an hour ago, perhaps, um, and my very broad conclusion on that is that it's possible that neither of them are. It's probable that uh, both of them are his uh, children. We don't have any conclusive evidence either way, and I don't think that we can therefore draw any firm conclusions either way. Um, so, yeah, I don't know. It's 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 there's 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 nothing conclusive about this, but I don't see, and and you could argue that because there's no conclusive evidence, then we have to assume that they are his children. That there are rumours, but they're only rumours, uh, and one or either or both could be or could not be, which is not perhaps the the, uh, the answer that a clear cut answer we'd like. But this is the world that George R. R. Martin has given us. He has given us a world that is not always 100% clear. It's a world where we have different people's views, not uh, an objective, omniscient third-person narrator telling us the truth of everything. Uh, Jewel Elson saying, many congrats on 300k subscribers. Thank you. Um, I missed the first few minutes um, and the cloak, but really looking forward to watching it later. P.S. Please say Higa Herga and Googly Woogly. I'm always happy to say Higa Herga and googly wiggly. Thank you very much for the super chat, and and I know you've uh, you've been a um, uh, part of this community and a viewer and a subscriber for for a long time. So uh, thank you. Uh, the next go to a question from Creative Branches. Um, if you could be in any house at the dawn of Aegon's conquest with an ear to the reigning lord, which house would you choose to be in? Um. Well. I mean, which house would I choose to be in? I think I, I always, as a default, if I have to live somewhere in the Seven Kingdoms, it's probably in the Reach. The Reach is, seems the, the nicest place. Uh, and House Gardener just seemed to have got this completely wrong. You you get a couple, you get Harren the Black, Argilac the Arrogant, both seem, I don't think you could have persuaded them not to uh, fight. I think that that was just in their natures. Um, but I think House Gardener just completely misunderstood the situation. They, they, got, they got the wrong email or something. They didn't think about dragons. They didn't understand how this was going to work. Um, and I just think maybe if they had a bit of better advice, I mean, if you're looking for a conspiracy theory, who was it who was advising them? House Tyrell. Who benefited most from House Gardener being destroyed utterly? House Tyrell. So if you want a conspiracy theory, there's one there for you. That's not something that's really suggested in the books, by the way. That's just a, uh, an observation from me. But um, I, th I think they're the ones who just played it the worst out of everybody. You can't... I, I, you expect it from Harren the Black. You expect it from um, Argilac. The Lannisters, yeah, they... They were involved in the, the field of fire, but they realized afterwards that they got it wrong uh, and then did the sensible thing. But um, really, the no, House Gardener just, they could have done so much better. Um, Lady Dane, what economic and social impact does the creation of King's Landing have on neighboring areas? It seems like Harrenhal and the Riverlands had the most impact, but they were already a bit disorganized. The Lannisters and the Tyrells seem to suffer uh, not much impact from a new city and trading port. Was it a positive change overall, or did some suffer because of the new center of attention? Okay, I, th this is the kind of question I, I love because it's the, kind of the geopolitical aspect of all of this. What 
uh, what happens when you create a new city. This is basically what happened. Uh, there was nothing at King's Landing there before. There were a couple of a couple of fishing villages. That was it. A, a city emerged over the course of a hundred years or so, and a massive city. Now, what impact did that have? There, there are two things I would draw to your attention. Other than the very broad, suddenly this is the kind of the center of, of things, and, and so. Uh, say yes Lannis port and uh and the like as ports didn't lose out much around that part well probably not but it did create this new hub a new trading hub more people more commerce probably did have a an overall positive impact but the two areas that really were impacted the first was old town old town was the city this was the 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 old town, the, the original place in, in Westeros that had been the biggest city for as long as anyone knew, uh, as long as Westeros had had humans. This was the centre of where the, the maesters were. This was the centre of where the, the Faith of the Seven was. This was the most populous place. This had the, one of the richest families there, the most influential families in the High Towers. Uh, when King's Landing suddenly becomes the centre of all of this life, this is where the court is, things shift. First of all, it becomes the big city. So if you're going to go stars in your eyes to the big city, you're going to go to King's Landing or Old Town. But in a more practical level, you see the shift of the faith of the seventh which realised that its fate was tied in. It had a very complicated relationship with the Targaryens, but it realised that its fate was tied in with the, uh, the Targaryen rule. They moved the home base of the faith from Old Town to King's Landing with the Great Sept. Uh, the High Septon was in King's Landing, not down, based down in Old Town. So the whole centre of gravity for the main religion moved. and. Also, to a lesser extent, with the maesters, the, the citadel stayed there. It was it, and clearly the training hub for the maesters were there. But the Grand Maester was up at King's Landing again. So there was a huge shift of the centre of gravity away from Old Town and to King's Landing. Old Town still survived and still thrived. It still had the Starry Sept was still... Uh, big and impressive and powerful, and the, the Citadel was still the hub of all things Maesters, but it was no longer the big city. The big city was King's Landing. So that's the first one, is a shift, a cultural shift from uh, Old Town to King's Landing. And the second one is the, the trading situation around uh, the gullet. Now, when the... Um, Targaryens landed before King's Landing. There was a big trading port just a few miles up the coast called Duskendale. There's another one, Maidenpool, and there were a few others. But the, the big one was Duskendale. When King's Landing grew, it took all of the trade away from Duskendale. Duskendale was once incredibly important, powerful, and rich. But the larger that King's Landing grew, the more and more of the trade just went to King's Landing. Why would you go to Duskendale? That's just a town. You can go to King's Landing. This is the capital. Um, so Duskendale really was impacted. Why does that matter? Well, it does have the implication much later in the story when you get the defiance of Duskendale. This is not just something which happened out of the blue for no reason whatsoever. Uh, the Lord Darklin, the Lord of Duskendale, kidnapping the king, didn't do that for no reason at all. Yes, the maesters obviously blamed his wife and claimed that she was some witch with magical powers because that's what the maesters always do. Maybe there was some truth in it, maybe there wasn't, but you know, maesters always do that. Um, this was based on a trading dispute. That, that's what it was. Lord Darklin 
was asking for a royal patent. He was basically asking for tax breaks. He was saying, King's Landing has taken all of our um, trade away, and we've got these huge tariffs that we have to pay to the Crown for anybody docking this ship here. And we're, you, we're, you're bleeding us dry. Can you give us a royal patent? Can you give us the tax breaks for this port? Or otherwise the port is going to die because of the massive port next door in King's Landing. And Eris II said, no. And Lord Darklin, probably not the wisest move in the world, but that he, he then captured him and kidnapped him. There was a reason for that. And it was a long-standing economic and political issue there with Duskendale. Um, question from Shasha saying, hi, Robert, long time no ask. <laughs> it is. I uh, hope you're oh, well. Society before the conquest. Uh, had Dragonstone been counted a part of the continent at all? Had there been any marriages between the Targaryens and Westerosi nobles? Had there been any kind of pacts? The Targaryens seem to have taken themselves out of Valyrian society by moving to Dragonstone. Um, had they cut all ties to Valyria and become a Westerosi house instead? Well, uh, they... No, is the short answer. They still consider themselves to be a Valyrian house. When... In terms of what was their relationship for that hundred years or so after the, they moved to Dragonstone, but before they invaded, that period they mostly were looking east until Aegon. Aegon and his sisters did, um, sounds like a 60s band, doesn't it? Aegon and his sisters. Uh, but when they arrived, when, when they started looking west before they invaded, they had a big interest in Westeros. The painted table, the famous painted table that we, we see that's in Dragonstone, big map of Westeros, that was, that was made before the invasion. It wasn't afterwards. This was because they wanted to look at it, maybe even start thinking about invading it. But they would visit um, parts of of Westeros, particularly down, they went down to the Reach, we hear. Uh, they went down, they went hunting with uh, in the Arbor with Lord Redwine. Apparently they visited the Lannisters. Um, so they'd met, they'd met a few of these people. They um, uh, were welcomed as foreign lords, um, but they weren't a part of Westerosi society. Was it counted as part of, was Dragonstone counted as part of Westeros? Well, I don't think because Westeros was never united as a whole, it was lots of different kingdoms. And But when it was just seven kingdoms, that was the smallest number of kingdoms it's ever been uh, up to that point. Then that meant that whether something was counted as part of Westeros wasn't really the point. The, the point was whether or not somebody, one of these petty kings claimed it for themselves probably at some point somebody did we don't so we don't know uh, who the targaryens kicked out of um dragonstone in order to take it um but they they did they got it um and the targaryens became chose to become westerosi it seems when they arrived at Westeros. Although there are, there's one hint that they were thinking about this a little bit before, which I'll get into just one moment. So when they arrived, that's when they decided that they needed a sigil, because that's what houses in Westeros had. But before that, they didn't need a sigil. They were just the Targaryens. Well, they're not house Targaryen. They're just a, a, a house from Valyria. They're, they're, um, and Valyrian houses did not have sigils, but they then decided that they wanted one, hence the dragon with three heads, because there were three of them. So that's the point at which they seem to have embraced the idea of being Westerosi. The one thing from before that, which just makes you think maybe something was the going on a little bit earlier, 
was that we read that before the invasion, there was a little bit of toing and froing with uh, with Argilac, uh, Dorandon Argilac the Arrogant, um, who you know, this, this is to do with the original, the reason for the invasion. It wasn't the reason for the invasion. They were probably always going to invade. Uh, but the, the catalyst for it was that he tried to initiate some bargaining with them, uh, saying, hey, do you want all this land over here? I can give you this land over here and uh, you can marry one of my daughters. Uh, and Aegon went, okay, two, two things. First of all, I don't think you own that land anyway. Um, and secondly, um, I've already got two wives. I don't need an, another one. But I'll tell you what, um, if you give me all that land and, and a little bit of this other hand, land here that you own, then you know we'll maybe we can talk. And he sent a, an envoy over, and Argilac went, no, nah, not having that. Uh, and then chopped off the hands of the envoy, nice guy that he was, and put them in a box and sent them back with a refusal. And that was the the reason why. Uh, the given reason why there was uh, the invasion happened. Now, after you get, uh, after Aegon got this box, um, he apparently went, I think all three of them went to the Sept, we're told, on Dragonstone and prayed, which is curious because they are a Valyrian family. They presumably still worship the Valyrian gods, but we never really hear about the Targaryens worshiping Valyrian gods. In fact, we don't really know what the Valyrian gods were. So, at some point, it would appear between the Targaryens leaving Valyria and invading Westeros, they seem to have uh, adopted the faith of the seven. Now, that's not to say that they became believers and followers of the faith of the seven. That's never the relationship they had with the faith, uh, but they saw it as a faith of convenience. And that kind of complicated relationship between the faith and the Targaryens carried on all the way through their reign. The Targaryens never saw themselves as being subject to the rules of the faith, but they saw that the faith was very important for the rulers of uh, Westeros. So um, this actually in, intriguingly does bring me back to the trailer that we saw a couple of days ago for House of the Dragon, because in that we get a very quick shot of what looks to be Viserys I, King Viserys, holding a sword, which presumably is Blackfire, the sword of the Targaryen kings. And on its pommel was a, what looked like a seven-pointed star. It may just have been some elaborate pattern, but it certainly was star-like, and it certainly had seven points on it, which led many people to go, what on earth are the Targaryens doing with a seven-pointed star? This sword is there for... Um, uh, for generations beforehand, this they wouldn't won't have been worshipping the uh, the uh, seven. I agree, but there is a possibility. In fact, it's not a possibility. There is a reality that the Targaryens, before they invaded, had accepted the reality of needing to, at the very least, have the appearance of adherence to the faith. Uh, because they went to the Sept to pray uh, and let it be known that that's what they did. So it's, um, were they were they a part of Westerosi culture? I don't think they ever thought of themselves as being Westerosi, but I think that they thought of themselves as being the rightful rulers of Westeros. Uh, Zakalok, um Hi, Robert. In opposition to other invasions, Aegon's invasion was very short and mostly military focused. What cultural aspect do you think this invasion brought in Westerosi everyday life? Um, it, well, it's a good, good question because 
you, on one level, you say not not much compared to the first men who came in and introduced humanity to Westeros, and then the Andals who got rid of a lot of the first men culture and the worship of the old gods and things like that. What did the Targaryens do when they came in? Well, they didn't intermarry with the locals. They didn't uh, try and change anybody's religion. Uh, they, in many ways, accepted the status quo, that even the majority of the ruling houses stayed in place, and the the overall sort of feudal system seems to have broadly stayed in place. So most of what happened was just them going, We'll leave it as it is. Thank you. We'll just put ourselves at the top and rule everybody. Um, so on one level, that's true. But on another level, what sort of long-term cultural impacts? There, there is very clearly a long-term cultural impact of boring things with real impacts, like the homogenization of laws and legal systems. You get... Um, Things like inheritance laws, like the the, the Queen Alison's laws about uh, the rights of widows, about the um, the right the Lord's right to the first night, um, things along those lines that were made. Uh, there's also the rule about the rule of thumb uh, about you know with what you can what size stick you can whack your wife with or or your anyone else um, that kind of that which was incidentally a real law that's where the rule of if you don't know about this this is a bit of horrible history for you uh is that this was the rule of thumb was that if if you if you had a a rod or a stick if it was thicker than your thumb then you were not allowed to hit your wife with it if it was thinner than your thumb then you could uh all your servants um so uh, that was back in sort of medieval times but that george george R. martin Obviously, saw that law and thought, "I'll have that in Westeros." That sounds like the kind of thing they'd have in Westeros. But these kind of things then become laws for the land as a whole. And what you find is that, whereas the, again the extremes of Westeros seem to have kind of resisted this and get away with that, so you can go, you know, the right of the first night still seems to be practiced. Some parts of the extremes of the north, uh, dawn manages to retain a lot of its culture the iron islands does as well but the main bit in the middle of westeros the riverlands the reach westerlands places like that they they do start to have a much more of a homogenization of culture and the the wars are no longer battles between individual parts of the kingdom or individual kingdoms their attempts to either secede from the kingdom or take over the kingdom. So so there's a, a sort of a big shift there, and particularly the kind of things that Jaehaerys did, Jaehaerys the first, boring things like building roads to connect the big cities, the King's Road, uh, that things like that. They, they were important parts of infrastructure. They were nation-building. Similarly, a lot of the work that happened in places like King's Land sewers and, and paving and, and, and all the rest of it that was very much a, a part of the culture change that happened that it's not just happening in king's landing but trying to spread this out across the entire uh, continent um question from uh, plum kettle uh, what do you think will happen to Dawn in the books? Congrats on 300k. You deserve all the subscribers. Well, thank you very much. Um, what will happen to Dawn? Um, I think, actually, I, th I think uh, maybe I had a question. Uh, uh, no, I can't say. If I did have a question on it from my on pa patrons, I can't see it. But what will happen to Dawn in, in the context of the books? Well, what will happen next is that we get the the latest iteration of Doran Martell's eternal cunning plan to marry his family to the Targaryens, uh, this time having um, attempted to be marrying Arianne to uh, Viserys and then attempted to marry um, 
Quentin to Daenerys. He's now going to try and marry Ariane to um, Fagon. So that will bind the Martells to Fagon. Why? Why will he want to do that? Well, as I've mentioned before on live stream, I think what's going to happen, he's going to get a special delivery coming in from Meereen very soon, which is coming from Barristan. We know he's going to do it because he said so. He's a man of his word. He is going to send Quentin's bones back to Dawn uh, with a little note attached to them that says, uh, hi, here's your son's, uh, your oldest son's bones. Uh, he did come as you requested to ask Daenerys to marry him. She said no. The very next day, in fact, she married someone else. Now she's flown off somewhere and we don't know where she is. And none of this is going to endear Doran to Daenerys Targaryen, uh, particularly when it's, uh, oh, and by the way, Daenerys' dragons then burnt your son to death. Uh, none of this is going to um, endear Daenerys to uh, Doran. And as he has an invasion already underway with somebody claiming to be a Targaryen, I think he will put his weight behind uh, him. So the Martells are going to be uh, bundled up with Fagon for certainly a large part of the Winds of Winter. That, however, is not going to last very well. Daenerys, there will be a kind of confrontation between Daenerys and Fagon, I suspect. And I think at that point, Doran, finally, his time will be up. And I think that we will see the next generation uh, in uh, in um, Dawn taking over. This is what has happened across the piece. You will see almost everywhere in the Seven Kingdoms, you will find that what has happened is that the, the elder statesman figure who was there, the patriarch, who was there as the leader of any main house is dies and who takes over quite often it's it's a woman that seems to be happening all over the place so um you get Tywin Lannister goes you've got Eddard Stark goes Robert Baratheon goes um Doran Martell will go all of these kind of patriarch figures will go and who's going to be left at the end uh, often it's going to be a woman and, and there who will it be maybe Ariane maybe one of the sand snakes um, we'll have to wait and see but that's what's going to be there I think Dawn will survive longer term I think Dawn will survive um, because mainly because I don't think the um, the Others will get that far south, and if the dragons attack, then the Dornish will do exactly what they've done before. George R. R. Martin set that up for us. Dawn will survive. Uh, Dawn will not give in to the dragons, um, and they will get to the other side and just carry on, is, is my guess on Dawn. A question from... Um, Mizratse uh, saying, not related to this current chat, but I can't take it anymore. What do you think the High Towers are doing in the current storyline right now? Uh, well, maybe I should do a maybe I should do a video on the High Towers. The High Towers right now are pre preparing to defend themselves against attack from um, Why do I always get mind blanks at some point? Uh, you, you know who I'm talking about. Um, somebody in the chat, so, uh, tell, tell me who it is. I, it's clearly far too late, and I clearly had far too big a sip of my uh, my wine. Um, uh, but uh, they they are there preparing uh, for, for an attack from the Ironborn. And what you'll find is that they have sent out, so you get Leighton Hightower, who has sent out his sons to go off on various missions one of them has head, headed off to lease to try and get some cell ships uh cell sails to come back um euron how can i forget Euron? <laughs> apologies uh but so he he sent um one son over there to go uh to try and get some cell sails to come back and help uh, defend uh the um, Old Town, another one is shoring up the defences, another one is going out trying to uh, get the uh, the weed, uh, weedle out any um, 
spies. Euron has been sending some spies into Old Town. Uh, Leighton Hightower and his daughter probably are there doing some sort of magic y thing. What is their so that's what their immediate priority is just defending um, Old Town? What is their game, bigger game? Because they are clearly a big and powerful, important family who haven't done much yet. Well, a lot of the, the boring answer is probably that just that. This is the history of House Hightower, with the uh, the honourable exception of the Dance of the Dragons, when they kind of overstepped the mark. Generally speaking, what they have done is they have stayed in the walls of Old Town, waited to see who's, who's going to come out on top in battle, in the a big war, and then just accepted them as the new leader. Uh, or if there's a, a big army outside they'll just shut the gates and just leave them outside or even if there's a plague going through the city shut the gates and see who survived and then uh, uh, carry on after that that is the default house high tower position is actually just we'll just stick here um their influ their their game plan is influence out through all of the different mechanisms they have through a bit of magic through uh, the the faith through the maesters that is where their influence goes there are other possibilities maybe they are the friends in the reach that uh, the golden company talk about um uh, but mostly they're staying at home i think uh Chaos ballerina how is torren viewed for kneeling wise cowardly this is uh the king who kneeled um Torrent Stark, he's I mean a bit of both, I think, is the answer. I think that it's viewed as a sad time for the Starks. I think that's very much the feel that we get from this, is that it's viewed as it's he he's the king who kneeled. He shouldn't have that's not what Starks are about. But I don't think anyone blames him for it. I, I don't get the impression from anyone that they go you know what, he really should have just tried to face down those dragons. I don't think anyone thinks that. So um, I think the the impression that I get from reading about, and this is, this is Stark history, so it's what the Starks think about it, is it's just a thing that was inevitable at the time. The, the Starks had long forgotten whatever it was they were supposed to be remembering. So uh, the the need for them to be that that was not a driving force. The need for them to be there it was just a, a matter of survival. And if they can survive as as um, wardens of the north, then great. Um, question from actually I've now got two more questions from my patrons so now is a good time to start dropping some questions into the chat i'll try and pick up as many questions in the chat as i can uh question from mara lee why was the last two decades of aegon's reign called the dragon's peace well aegon was called aegon the dragon um just his nickname uh as well as being aegon the conqueror um and it was the dragon's peace because he had war for 15 years, and that's a long time just to be at non-stop war. That's like twice the length of the Second World War in our world. This was a very, very long war that he had going on there, invading uh, most of Westeros, then invading the Iron Islands, and an interminably long series of conflicts against Dawn. Um, there were even a few little insurrections that um, the sisters, those those little islands um, between White Harbour and the um, the the Vale, they um, fingers they they rebelled randomly. Uh, so there was war for fifteen years, and then finally Aegon came to a peace accord with the Dornish, and from that moment he then went to trying to establish his kingdom. And so it was 
uh, it was the dragon's piece. The the piece was there because not because everybody loved him, because everybody thought, "Yo, oh, you're our great and wondrous and wise ruler," because he had a dragon. That was that was why, and people were not going to rebel against him because he had a dragon. Um, over time, yes, he got allies, he gained respect, uh, but this was the dragon's piece, and this was the time that he could start really building the, the King's Landing, the, the base that he wanted there, building the connections, the, uh, trying to unite the Seven Kingdoms into one kingdom. Uh, this was his time of peace. Uh, Lauren Mintz saying, Hello, Robert. My question is about the mentality or evolution of the Targaryens. During the conquest, Aegon was ruthless against those who opposed him, but also very lenient to those who supported him, even if they did initially attack him. To me, this doesn't seem like what the modern Westerosi say is the Targaryen nature, as they are thought to be bringers uh, of only fire and blood. It just doesn't seem like Aegon was as bloodthirsty as they say the Targaryens were. Is this supposed to reflect the views of the people post-Robert's Rebellion? Um, or should we just blame the incest? Uh, what's your take and what do you think George R. Martin is trying to say here? Well, my take is that um, the, the stories that we have been told about Aegon the Conqueror we always have to look through the filter that George R. R. Martin gives us, which is the filter of, of the um, uh, the maesters. Now, what is interesting is that we have in the world of ice and fire, we have a different maester doing the reporting on. The Aegon's conquest and the early years compared to the rest of it. The rest of it, the majority of it is written, and you can read at the beginning, the front page of the world of ice and fire is this, um, this great dedication to the wise and wonderful Robert Baratheon, long may he reign over us, isn't this amazing? Getting rid of the terrible Targaryens, uh, what a wonderful king. And everything else has to be read within that this is the maesters writing it for a king, not wishing to make the Targaryens look too good. However, the bit about Aegon the Conqueror was written by somebody within the time of the Targaryen rule. So they that the temptation there would have been to be slightly easier or perhaps slightly more objective. So that's that's what George R. Martin is doing here, is he's actually giving us a couple of different perspectives. And what we shouldn't take is the world of ice and fire, fire and blood as objective assessments of exactly what happened. This is his fake history written by fake historians. So that said, um, was Aegon the Conqueror more lenient than later Targaryens? I mean, I don't think... You would say that personally, if you look at what he did, he was very canny. As I say, I, I thought the cleverest thing, the smartest thing he did was this uh, upfront saying, if you bend the knee, then you can have all of the powers that you had. You just can't call yourself king anymore. Um, that was very smart and very lenient. But to anyone who opposed, it absolutely no uh, holding back at all, melting castle burning the, the field field of fire he burned the entire army that that was what it was then the targaryens as a whole they burned all the way across dawn planky town which is if, if you imagine a a port one of those ports that's just made up of uh, of little boats tied up against each other to create a sort of a large um platform of planks of flat boats, uh, they burnt it. People, innocent people died. This wasn't a, a, an army base. This wasn't a, a place where the, uh, the Dornish Navy were based. This was a civilian port, and they went and burnt it just because they wanted to, Targaryens wanted to show the, 
the Dornish, they meant it. So this, that they meant things. So there was a lot of fire and blood that went on there. This wasn't, um, this wasn't sort of nice and lenient. It was pure pragmatism. This, I will leave you in power. So is Georgia, is, is, is Aegon the first able to uh, is is he different noticeably different from the rest of the targaryens i don't think so personally i don't think that that's what george R. R. martin is trying to say i think that the fact that he's a long time in the past means that perhaps uh, it is easier for people to be able to view him through slightly more rose tinted spectacles um it's what you find george R. R. martin i think does play with this is that when people are given monikers, when they're given a, a name by history, we interpret them through that lens. Uh, Argilac the Arrogant was not called Argilac the Arrogant by his own people in his own time. He was called that in poster afterwards because he was so arrogant he faced, against the, faced down the Targaryens. S similarly, you get Magor the Cruel was called afterwards this is the name and then you interpret everything he does through that lens Aegon the Conqueror Aegon the Dragon we're interpreting everything through that lens he did do some things which were good and solid ruling he did some things which were incredibly cruel and unnecessarily killing innocent civilians but I don't think that made him any different from the Targaryens later there were some Targaryens who seemed to have been better people than that um, there are some Targaryens who seem to have been uh, a lot more fire and bloody than that. Um, what I think George R. R. Martin, to sort of return us to where we began, is doing is playing with this idea of Daenerys being in the place of Aegon the Conqueror. And is she going to do the same thing that he did? On the show, she definitely did do exactly the same thing with the kneel and if you kneel you can retain your place and if you do not then i will burn you and that was very much what he did at the time so it was if if that's where they go in the books then um it's actually he's exactly the same as the targaryen we have now uh, right, let's have a look in the chat reflective rambling picking up something for thomas de kirschmacher saying in your opinion did Aegon fail as a father by not preparing Aenys uh, for a steady succession and rule? He failed as nurturing Magor to a decent person. Do we blame him or his sisters? Well, I mean, this is a bit of a sort of a nature or nurture kind of thing, isn't it? I don't think Aegon came across as a natural dad, <laughs> a natural parent figure. Um, but I don't think that we can blame the parents entirely for the children's character that there's some elements of that yes absolutely some elements of it no uh, so um could he have done more i think he probably could um he definitely didn't seem to um take uh so anus was for those who've not read on he was he was a weak ruler um Targaryens were strong, and uh, but he himself was a weak ruler. There was a potential for it all to come collapsing down around his ears. Um, and then Maegor came in, who was a very strong ruler, but also in many ways uh, a failure. People turned against him. So uh, neither lived up to um, uh, Aegon. And in, in many ways, you, you see them, they're kind of the, the yin and yang, uh, yes, they reflect their mothers, but also the different parts of Aegon's personality, that he seemed to have both possibilities within him, but he married them together, in which worked, but when they're separate, no. He had the leniency, as we've seen, but that was tied with the ability to burn people alive. Um, so. With Magor, it was just about the burning people alive. With Anus, it was just about the leniency. What you needed is the, the both together. 
Um, right, let's have a quick uh, flick through. Um, Andrew Kay saying the historians have their personal biases. Changing a few details can change a great to a cruel or a mad. Absolutely, yeah. I mean, this is true for our our society, our history as much as as much as any others. And I think George Martin has done really well to uh, allow uh, or to introduce that into into his world as well. Um, uh, Shauna Bass, it'll be interesting to see how Danny is perceived versus Aegon, with her being a woman versus a man. I'm not sure if anyone ever called Aegon mad, uh, so it'll be interesting. Yeah, that's that's a really good point. George R. Martin definitely uses this as well as trying to show how women doing exact same things as men get viewed differently. So I think that um, at the risk of going meta on this, the the fact that the TV show prompted a debate about whether Danny was mad, um, I think is actually the kind of debate that George R. R. Martin is going to try and make us have about book Danny, in that he will we we're naturally on her side, but she will almost certainly do things that we don't a hundred percent agree with, and perhaps sometimes we might a hundred percent disagree with. Um, but what, why is that? Is that just a part of her nature? Can she do anything about that? Should we start to dislike her? These are the kinds of questions that George R. Martin, I think, is wanting us to uh, explore. Danny is taking a darker turn uh, in the next two books. That's not my opinion. That's not what I think. That's what George R. R. Martin has said. So uh, I th we can talk around what exactly that means, what exactly she's going to do. But the fact is that she's going to take a darker turn, a more fire and blood turn, is George R. R. Martin has confirmed that. So uh, that's now baked into our understanding of where she's going. What he is going to want us to do is, is take at the sympathy that he gave us the first few chapters of Danny. We are so sympathetic to her. And because of everything that happened to her, and a lot of that sympathy remains all the way through the five books that we've had, um, despite her, again, not doing necessarily exactly what we would want all the time, we're still very sympathetic to her. Is she going to keep our sympathy? And that's something I think George R. Martin is, is wanting to play with in the next uh, couple of books. Um, Martin McFly, how did the Dornish just go into hiding and just attack the Targaryen army when the dragons left? Well, we don't know. We're not told, and that's because they weren't. They won't divulge their secrets. But the the clear implication is that this is the this is like guerrilla warfare. Now, this is the, the. I don't know whether George R. Martin talked about it in exactly these terms, but this is like Vietnam. That's what he wanted the feel to be. Is that. Uh, you, they knew, the Targaryens knew where the Dornish were, but by the time they got there, the Dornish knew the, ter the territory so much better than them than they just disappeared. Maybe they dug underground. Who knows? They can't find them. Uh, maybe they've gone somewhere else. Maybe uh, they've, they've found some ingenious way of hiding from uh, dragons flying above. We don't know. The, the, the whole point is that this is them knowing and understanding their local terrain and fighting a guerrilla warfare that dragons can't, superior firepower just cannot deal with it. Um, reflective ramblings, are you saying the good queen Alison is a lie? Uh, Self of my heart. I, I mean, I don't, I don't know if I'm saying that it's a lie. Um, I think that she was a good queen, actually, as I said, I said, I said earlier, on, she's one of my favourite Targaryens. Um, but I think that um, we come into our understanding of what she's like through the prism of thinking she is good Queen Alison. Uh, we don't come into it thinking this is the if if um, if somebody else were writing her story and wishing to cast her in, in a bad light, uh, they may say um, they may put her the. Um, Queen Alison, the brother lover, Queen Alison, the um, 
I, I don't know, whatever, but she did a whole load of things that you might think, mm, not so sure about that. Uh, she was very much happy and on board with this uh, this teaching and, and idea that went around that said that the Targaryens are not like everyone else and therefore shouldn't be subject to the same rules as everyone else. To me, that comes across as um, uh, saying that they are better than other people. Um, so there's, there are words for that which are not particularly nice. You could apply one of those to uh, to her. Um, but generally speaking, yes, I think she was a, a good queen. Um, Beres Aurelius saying, Aegon was basically a Civ Six player in the late game. I got these nukes. Guess I might as well use them. Um, yeah. Yeah, I, mean, I think so. I, it's more uh, if you're going to go into Civ uh, Civ games. Um, I don't think I ever played Civ Six, but I played I played a few Civ games. Uh, but basically, he's he's the situation where he sends out and what do you send out? Envoys. I can't remember diplomats. Uh, and you can lay out down some terms and say surrender now and um, and bend the knee. And if they don't, then you nuke. That's the work. That's the thing he's in. Rather than just saying, "Well, I think I might as well just use these nukes," he gives people the option. He sends in the diplomat first. Um, Andrew K saying uh, could have been avoided, but I think the carnage of Harren Hall is often underplayed. It was not just a family. He was basically it was basically a metropolis. Uh, likely Aegon roasted thousands. Yeah, it's absolutely true. So I think that this is something. Uh, I mean. I've noted this before, and I think you're absolutely right to note it as well. He, the Harren Hall is huge. I mean, acres and acres big. It's the biggest castle, the size of a town, um, and there were thousands of people who lived there, uh, and they weren't all soldiers by any stretch of the imagination. And what happened was not just well, I'll just precision shoot the the king, Harren the Black, and his sons. No, this was, I am absolutely melting every stone in this tower. That's what happened. Even, even the people preparing the dinner down in the, the, the cooks down um, uh, on the ground floor, they're, they're gone. Absolutely everyone's gone. It was merciless. One could argue that this was necessary in order to win the war. Yes. Absolutely, I think it probably was. Does that make it a good act? No, it does not. He was, a, uh, he was an invader. Nobody invited him in. He decided that he wanted to be in charge, and the way to be in charge is to kill other people. So it was not a good act, uh, and it did kill a lot of um, innocent people. But he became king. Uh, so we, we have to say that's what the end result of it was. Um Uh, Sam Day saying, are you able to give a quick overview of what Varys and Illyrio were doing behind the scenes? Um, quick overview, I don't know if I can, but basically the uh, the, the cunning plan has been uh, all along, it's changed, the details of the plan change a lot, which is what I think confuses everybody. Uh, but the plan all along has been to get their guy on the throne. Now, uh, that will happen a number of different ways. The the first of all, they thought, well, we'll get Viserys to come with the Dothraki horde and sweep across um, the land, uh, and then we'll bring our guy in after that and get him to marry Daenerys. And well, by implication, Viserys would have an accident or die or something. They knew they knew what Viserys was like. Viserys was not going to remain. Uh, a loved king for very long. So um, that was a part of the plan. Then obviously that fell through. They still had their guy. They thought, okay, well, we've been preparing him all the way through uh, this time. With these teachers making him the best possible king he can be. Uh, they then decided now's the moment to do this. Can we marry him to Daenerys? Daenerys has gone missing. Okay, fair enough. We'll just launch the invasion without Daenerys. Uh, we've got the Golden Company here. Uh, and so that's what the plan is. They were wanting to time the invasion, whoever it was, however it happened, in as good a way as for when the country was at war. 
uh, so that they could, and weak, and they could come in and sweep all before them and put their person on the throne, say, this is actually the rightful Lord. See how how mucked up the kingdom has been since the Targaryens have been away. This is the rightful Targaryen we're putting on the throne. Hey, here's the sword of Blackfire. He can have that. He must be the rightful king. That's the plan. The details of how it was work, going to work did shift about a lot, which I think is what confuses people. Um, question, any more question? I think um, Eli Thomas saying, would you ever consider doing a live stream about Th Sothorios? I don't know much about the area, but it's something I'd love to see you explore and your thoughts on. Um, I, I mean, uh, maybe a video. I think that the thing that we we have I, is with places like Sothorios, we literally have, have like three or four pages of text on it. And that's it. Um, now we can, so for live streams, uh, I, I what I try and do is have subjects that either we've got a lot of stuff on that we can talk about or have huge implications for the story so that we can uh, discuss around the, all the implications. So Thorios is interesting, it is fascinating, but this is not central to the story. Um, so maybe what I could do, and, and I would have to think about uh, what to call it, but something like the fringes of the known world, because there's a lot of places that, that I've not done a live stream about that it might be quite interesting to talk about for a while. I've not talked about Ib. Uh, I've not talked about the Sunset Isles. I've not talked about what's west of Westeros. That that kind of thing. So, uh, yeah, maybe I'll maybe I'll add that to the list. Uh, thank you very much. Um, did I do in all the rest of it, Andrew Kay? I, I may well have done. Um, okay. Uh, I think, uh, thank you uh, uh, very much for that. I think with that, I'm going to start drawing this one to a close. Um, next week, I have, I think I'm right in saying I've got another one of my Lord of the Rings live streams. I'm going to uh, try and introduce you once more to another fantastic Lord of the Rings uh, creator. We're moving through the history of, of, of Middle Earth, building up towards when we've got the, uh, the Lord of the Rings TV show happening. So I'm just trying to take everybody through the ages. I'm very aware of the fact that um, everyone obviously knows the books and the films, but the background, the history, things like the Silmarillion, there's so much there. It's so amazing, but uh, not everybody has read it. And if they have read it, it might have been a while since they've done so. Uh, so I'm wanting to take us all through the history, just get us all up to speed so we know what's going on when the TV show happens. Um, and frankly, when trailers and things start dropping, uh, there will be a lot of um, uh, background information uh, that would be fantastic for us to know. So that's the plan next week. And then the week after that, I'll be back to some more Song of Ice and Fire. And I think that's when I'm going to be doing Dance of the Dragons. So um, if you are watching this back a little bit later and you like these live streams and you want to watch some more, there will be a link appearing somewhere up here a little bit later. Uh, if you wish to support this channel, thank you, first of all. Um, and thank you to everyone again for all your support. Uh, as I've come up to 300,000 subscribers, it means huge amounts to me, so thank you. But if you would like to support this channel, the best way to do it there will be a link to my Patreon. Uh, thanks, everyone. Take care, and I will see you again next week.